It was sometime early in 1986, the first year of the decline of my firm, Solomon Brothers. Our chairman, John Goodfriend, left his desk at the head of the trading floor and went for a walk. At any given moment on the trading floor, billions of dollars were being risked by bond traders. Goodfriend was the last person the nerve-wracked trader wanted to see, especially when he snuck up from behind and surprised you. Often as not, our chairman just hovered quietly for a bit, then left. This day in 1986, however, Goodfriend did something strange. Instead of terrifying us all, he walked a straight line to John Merriweather, a Solomon board member and also one of Solomon's finest bond traders. He whispered a few words. The traders in the vicinity eavesdropped. What Goodfriend said has become a legend at Solomon Brothers and a visceral part of its corporate identity. He said, One hand, one million dollars, no tears. The King of Wall Street, as Business Week had dubbed Goodfriend, wanted to play a single hand of a game called Liar's Poker for a million dollars. He played the game most afternoons with Merriweather. The peculiar feature of Goodfriend's challenge this time was the size of the stake. Normally his bets didn't exceed a few hundred dollars. The final two words of his challenge, no tears, meant that the loser was expected to suffer a great deal of pain, but wasn't entitled to whine about it. It seemed an act of sheer lunacy. Merriweather was the liar's poker champion of the Solomon Brothers trading floor. The whole absurd situation needs putting into context. John Merriweather had made hundreds of millions of dollars for Solomon Brothers. He had an ability to hide his state of mind. Most traders divulge whether they are making or losing money by the way they speak or move. With Merriweather, you could never, ever tell. Merriweather cast a spell over the young traders who worked for him. They became disciples. They became obsessed by the game of liar's poker. They regarded it as their game. John Goodfriend was always the outsider in their game. When you managed a firm, you received your quota of envy, fear, and admiration, but for all the wrong reasons. You did not make the money for Solomon. You did not take risk. You were hostage to your producers. They took risk. The money came from risk-takers such as Merriweather, and whether it came or not was really beyond good friends' control. That's why many people thought that the single rash act of challenging the arbitrage boss to one hand for a million dollars was good friends' way of showing he was a player, too. People like John Merriweather believed that liar's poker had a lot in common with bond trading. It tested a trader's character. It honed a trader's instincts. A good player made a good trader, and vice versa. We all understood it. In Liar's Poker, a group of people, as few as two, as many as ten, form a circle. Each player holds a dollar bill close to his chest and attempts to fool the others about the serial numbers printed on the face of his dollar bill. One trader begins by making a bid. He says, for example, three sixes. He means that all told, the serial numbers of the dollar bills held by every player, including himself, contain at least three sixes. Once the first bid has been made, the game moves clockwise in the circle. Let's say the bid is three sixes. The player to the left of the bidder can bid higher numbers or challenge. That is like saying, I doubt it. The bidding escalates until all the other players agree to challenge a single player's bid. Then, and only then, do the players reveal their serial numbers and determine who is bluffing whom. The hard part is reading the faces of the other players. The complexity arises when all players know how to bluff and double bluff. The code of the liar's poker player was something like the code of the gunslinger. It required a trader to accept all challenges. Because of the code, which was his code, John Merriweather felt obliged to play. But he knew it was stupid. For him, there was no upside. If he won, he upset good friend. But if he lost, he was out of pocket a million bucks. No, John, Merriweather said. I'd rather play for real money. Ten million dollars, no tears. Ten million dollars. It was a moment for all players to savor. Merriweather was playing liar's poker before the game even started. He was bluffing. Goodfriend considered the counterproposal. It would have been just like him to accept. Merely to entertain the thought was a luxury that must have pleased him well. It was good to be rich. Maybe the whole point of his challenge was to judge Merriweather's response. Even Goodfriend had to marvel at the king in action. Goodfriend smiled his own brand of forced smile and said, 
you're crazy. No, thought Merriweather, just very, very good. I was living in London in the winter of 1984, finishing a master's degree at the London School of Economics, when I received an invitation to dine with the Queen Mother at St. James's Palace. What had been advertised as a close encounter with British royalty proved to be a fundraiser with seven or eight hundred insurance salesmen. Somewhere in the palace, as luck would have it, were two managing directors from Solomon Brothers. I knew this only because, as luck would have it, I was seated between their wives. When one of the wives learned that I was preparing to enter the job market and was considering investment banking, she turned the evening into an interview. I was soon invited by her husband to the London offices of Solomon and introduced to traders and salesmen on the trading floor. I liked the commercial buzz of their environment, but I still did not have a formal job offer, and I wasn't subjected to a proper round of job interviews. A few days later, I received a call to have breakfast with Leo Corbett, the head of Solomon Recruiting. At breakfast, we had a pleasant talk, which was disconcerting, because Solomon Brothers recruiters were meant to be bastards. It seemed clear Corbett wanted me to work at Solomon, but he never came right out and proposed. Finally, I told a fellow student at the London School of Economics what had happened. As he badly wanted a job with Solomon Brothers, he knew exactly what I had to do. Solomon Brothers never made job offers. It only gave hints. The best thing for me to do was call Leo Corbett and take the job from him. So I did. I called him, reintroduced myself, and said, I want to let you know that I accept. Glad to have you on board, he said, and laughed. He explained that I would start life at the Brothers in a training program that commenced in July 1984 at the New York headquarters with 120 other students. Days passed. I knew nothing about trading, and as a result, next to nothing about Solomon Brothers. For Solomon Brothers is, more than any other firm on Wall Street, a firm run by traders. I knew only what I had read in the papers, and they said that Solomon Brothers was the world's most profitable investment bank. True as that might be, the process of landing a job with the firm had been suspiciously pleasant. 6,000 people had applied that year. Most of the people with whom I would eventually work were badly savaged in their interviews and had grisly stories to tell. I had no battle scars and felt mildly ashamed. Oh, all right, I confess. One of the reasons I pounced on the Solomon Brothers' opportunity like a loose ball was that I had already seen the dark side of a Wall Street job hunt. As a college senior in 1981, I applied to banks. At the time, I didn't give trading so much as a passing thought. In this, I wasn't unusual. College seniors considered trading floors cages for untrained animals. My Princeton University class of 1982 was among the last to hold this view firmly. So we didn't apply to work on trading floors. Instead, we angled for lower-paying jobs in corporate finance, with a starting salary of about 25000 plus bonus. When all was said and done, the pay came to around $6 an hour. The job title was Investment Banking Analyst. At Solomon Brothers, analysts were the lowest of the low. They photocopied, proofread, and assembled breathtakingly dull securities documents for 90-plus hours a week. A few of the very best analysts lost their will to live normal lives. They gave themselves entirely over to their employers and worked around the clock. By definition, an analyst's job lasted only two years. Then he was expected to go to business school. The analyst was a prisoner of his own narrowly focused ambition. He wanted money. There was one sure way to get it, and everyone with eyes in 1982 saw it. Major in economics... Use your economics degree to get an analyst job on Wall Street. Use your analyst job to get into the Harvard Business School and worry about the rest of your life later. So, more than any other, the question that my classmates and I were asking was, how do I become a Wall Street analyst despite the logjam at the point of entry? Forty percent of the 1,300 members of Yale's graduating class of 1986 applied to one investment bank alone, First Boston. At Harvard, in 1987, the course in the Principles of Economics had 40 sections and a 1,000 students. The enrollment had tripled in 10 years. An economics degree became a requirement for a job on Wall Street. In the midst of the hysteria, I was suitably hysterical. 
I had made a conscious decision not to study economics at Princeton, partly because everyone else was doing it for what sounded to me like the wrong reasons. I landed in one of the least used departments on campus. Art history was the opposite of economics. No one wanted it on his resume. Art history, as an economics major once told me, is for preppy girls from Connecticut. The chief economic purpose of art history was clandestinely to lift the grade point averages of the economics students. To be fair, art was only the start of my problems. It didn't help that my resume listed bartending and skydiving as skills. Born and raised in the Deep South, I had never heard of investment bankers until a few months before my first job interview. Nevertheless, Wall Street seemed very much like the place to be at the time. I was frightened to miss the express bus on which everyone I knew seemed to have a reserved seat. I certainly had no fixed idea of what to do when I graduated from college, and Wall Street paid top dollar for what I could do, which was nothing. My motives were shallow. That wouldn't have mattered, and could even have been an advantage if I had felt the slightest conviction that I deserved a job, but I didn't. Many of my classmates had sacrificed the better part of their formal educations for Wall Street. I had sacrificed nothing. In short, I wasn't going to be an investment banker any time soon. My moment of reckoning came immediately after the first interview of the 1982 season, with the Wall Street firm of Lehman Brothers. Investment bankers had a technique known as the stress interview. If you were invited to Lehman's New York offices, your first interview might begin with the interviewer asking you to open the window. The window was sealed shut. That was, of course, the point. The interviewer just wanted to see whether your inability to comply with his request led you to yank, pull, and sweat until finally you melted into a puddle of foiled ambition, or, as one sad applicant was rumored to have done, threw a chair through the window. Another stress-inducing trick was the silent treatment. You'd walk into the interview chamber. The man in the chair would say nothing. You'd say hello. He'd stare. You'd say that you'd come for a job interview. He'd stare some more. You'd make a stupid joke. He'd stare and shake his head. You were on tender hooks. Then he'd pick up a newspaper, or worse, your resume, and begin to read. He was testing your ability to take control of a meeting. In this case, presumably, it was acceptable to throw a chair through a window. On the appointed day, at the appointed hour, I rubbed two sweaty palms together outside the interview chamber and did a quick equipment check. Like an astronaut preparing for liftoff, my strengths: I was an overachiever, a team player, and a people person. Whatever that meant. My weaknesses: I worked too hard and tended to move too fast for the organizations I joined. My name was called. The greatest absurdity of the college investment banking interview was the people the investment bank sent to conduct them. Many of them hadn't worked on Wall Street for more than a year, but they had acquired Wall Street personas. One of their favorite words was professional. Sitting stiffly, shaking firmly, speaking crisply, and sipping a glass of ice water were professional. Laughing and scratching your armpits were not. The young man began to fire questions at me. Perhaps the best way to describe our encounter is to recount, as best as memory will allow, what passed for our conversation. Square young man. Why don't you explain to me the difference between commercial banking and investment banking? Me, investment bankers underwrite securities. Commercial bankers make loans. Square young man, do you know the size of the U.S. GNP? Me, I'm not sure. Isn't it about five hundred billion dollars? Square young man, more like three trillion. You know, we interview hundreds of people here for each position. You're up against a lot of economics majors who know their stuff. Why do you want to be an investment banker? Obviously, the honest answer was that I didn't know. That was unacceptable. After a waffle or two, I gave him what I figured he wanted to hear. Me. Well, really, when you get right down to it, I want to make money. Square young man. That's not a good reason. You work long hours in this job, and you have to be motivated by more than just money. Frankly, we try to discourage people from our business who are too interested in money. That's all. That's all. The words ring in my ears. Before I could stop it from happening, I was standing outside the cubicle in a cold sweat. Why did the square young man from Lehman take offense at the suggestion? 
A friend who eventually won a job with Lehman Brothers later explained, It's taboo, he said. You're supposed to talk about the thrill of doing deals and the excitement of working with outstanding people, but never ever mention money. From then on, whenever an investment banker asked for my motives, I dutifully handed him the correct answers. That money wasn't the binding force was, of course, complete and utter bullshit. Did anyone doubt the importance of money on Wall Street other than people from Wall Street when talking to people from elsewhere? Still, the tale has a happy ending. Lehman Brothers eventually went belly up in early 1984. The senior partners were forced to go hat in hand to Wall Street rival Shearson, which bought them out. Whether Lehman's misfortune was directly related to its unwillingness to admit it was out to make money, I do not know. I remember almost exactly how I felt and what I saw my first day at Solomon Brothers. There was a cold shiver doing laps around my body. I rose early to walk around Wall Street before going to the office. I had never seen the place before. There was a river at one end and a graveyard at the other. In between was vintage Manhattan, a deep, narrow canyon in which yellow cabs smacked into raised sewer lids, potholes, and garbage. Armies of worried men in suits stormed off the Lexington Avenue subway line and marched down the crooked pavements. For rich people, they didn't look very happy. Solomon Brothers had written me in London to announce that it would pay me an MBA's wage, though I had no MBA, of $42,000 plus a bonus after the first six months of 6000 more. Perhaps it is worth explaining where this money was coming from. In 1985, Wall Street was hot, and Solomon Brothers was Wall Street's most profitable firm. Wall Street traffics in stocks and bonds. At the end of the 1970s, Solomon Brothers knew more about bonds than any firm on Wall Street. How to value them, how to trade them, and how to sell them. The rest of Wall Street had been content to let Solomon Brothers be the best bond traders because the occupation was neither terribly profitable nor prestigious. The biggest myth about bond traders, and therefore the greatest misunderstanding about the unprecedented prosperity on Wall Street in the 1980s, is that they make their money by taking large risks. A few do, and all traders take small risks, but most traders act simply as toll-takers. In other words, Solomon carved a tiny fraction out of each financial transaction. This adds up. The Solomon salesman sells $50 million worth of a new IBM bond to Pension Fund X. The Solomon trader, who provides the salesman with the bonds, takes for himself an eighth of a percentage point, or $62,500. He may, if he wishes, take more. In the bond market, unlike in the stock market, commissions are not openly stated. Now the fun begins. Once the trader knows the location of the IBM bonds and the temperament of their owner, he doesn't have to be outstandingly clever to make the bonds move again. He can generate his own magic. He can, for example pressure one of his salesmen to persuade insurance company Y that the IBM bonds are worth more than Pension Fund X paid for them initially. Whether it is true is irrelevant. The trader buys the bonds from X and sells them to Y and takes out another eighth of a percentage point, and the pension fund is happy to make a small profit in such a short time. In this process, it helps if neither of the parties on either side of the middleman knows the value of the treasure. The men on the trading floor have PhDs in man's ignorance. In any market, as in any poker game, there is a fool. The astute investor Warren Buffett is fond of saying that any player unaware of the fool in the market probably is the fool in the market. Solomon Brothers bond traders knew about fools because that was their job. Knowing about markets is knowing about other people's weaknesses. And a fool, they would say, was a person who was willing to sell a bond for less than it was worth or buy a bond for more. A bond was worth only as much as the person who valued it properly was willing to pay. And Solomon, to complete the circle, was the firm that valued the bonds properly. But none of this explains why Solomon Brothers was particularly profitable in the 1980s. Making profits on Wall Street is a bit like eating the stuffing from a turkey. Some higher authority must first put the stuffing into the turkey. One of the benevolent hands doing the stuffing belonged to the Federal Reserve. 
at a rare Saturday press conference on October the 6th, 1979, Paul Volcker, chairman of the Fed, announced that the money supply would cease to fluctuate with the business cycle and interest rates would float. The event, I think, marks the beginning of the golden age of the bond man. Had Volcker never pushed through his radical change in policy, the world would be many bond traders and one memoir, the poorer. For in practice, interest rates would swing wildly. Bond prices move inversely, lockstep, to rates of interest. Allowing interest rates to swing wildly meant allowing bond prices to swing wildly. Bonds had been conservative investments, into which investors put their savings when they didn't fancy a gamble in the stock market. After Volcker's speech, bonds became objects of speculation, a means of creating wealth rather than merely storing it. Overnight, the bond market was transformed from a backwater into a casino. Once Volcker had set interest rates free, the other hand stuffing the turkey went to work. America's borrowers. As the American government, consumers, and corporations borrowed more money, the volume of bonds exploded. Another way to look at this is that investors were lending money more freely than ever before. The combined indebtedness of the three groups in 1977 was $323 billion, much of which wasn't bonds, but loans made by commercial banks. By 1985, the three groups had borrowed $7 trillion. What is more, thanks to financial entrepreneurs at places like Solomon and the shakiness of commercial banks, a much greater percentage of the debt was cast in the form of bonds than ever before. A Solomon salesman who had in the past moved $5 million worth of merchandise through the trader's books each week was now moving $300 million through each day. He, the trader, and the firm began to get rich, and they decided for reasons best known to themselves to invest some of their winnings in buying people like me. Classes at Solomon Brothers were held on the 23rd floor of its building on the southeastern tip of Manhattan. As I walked into the training area, the other trainees were gathered in packs, chattering. Cliques had gelled. Already, opinions had formed of who was cut out for the Solomon trading floor and who was a loser. One group of men stood in a circle playing a game I didn't recognize, but now know to be liar's poker. They were laughing, cursing, eyeing each other sideways, and generally behaving in a brotherly, traitorly manner. We were as civil to the big man addressing the class as we had been to anyone, which wasn't saying much. He was the speaker for the entire afternoon. That meant he was trapped for three hours in the ten-yard trench in the floor at the front of the room. The man paced back and forth in the channel like a coach on the sidelines. We sat in rows of interconnected school chairs, 22 rows of white male trainees in white shirts, punctuated by two blacks, a cluster of Japanese, and the occasional female in a blue blazer. The room was hot and stuffy. We were only one week into our five-month training program, and I was already exhausted. I sank in my chair. The speaker, a leading bond salesman at Solomon, was doing well with the crowd. People in the back row listened. All around the room, trainees put down their New York Times crossword puzzles. The man was telling us how to survive. You got to think of Solomon Brothers as a jungle, he said. The trading floor is a jungle, he went on, and the guy you end up working for is your jungle leader. You've got to learn from your boss. He's key. Imagine if I take two people and I put them in the middle of the jungle and I give one person a jungle guide and the other person nothing. Inside the jungle, there's a lot of bad shit going down. Outside the jungle, there's a TV that's got the NCAA finals on and a huge fridge full of bud. The speaker had found the secret to managing the Solomon Brothers class of 1985. Win the hearts and minds of the back row. Even when they felt merely ambivalent about a speaker, back row people slept or chucked paper wads at the wimps in the front row. But if the back row people for some reason didn't care for a speaker, all hell broke loose. Not now. Primitive revelations swept through the back of the classroom at the sound of the jungle drums. The guys in the back row were leaning forward in their seats for the first time all day. Ooh, ah. With the back row neutralized, the speaker effectively controlled the entire audience, for the people sitting in the front row were on automatic pilot. 
They were the same as front row people all over the world, only more so. Most graduates of the Harvard Business School sat in the front row. A huge fridge full of buds, said the speaker, a second time. And chances are good that the guy with the jungle god is going to be the first one through the jungle to the TV and the beer. Not to say the other guy won't eventually get there too, but... Here he stopped pacing and even gave the audience a little sly look. He'll be real thirsty and there's not going to be any beer left when he arrives. The guys in the back row liked it. They fell all over each other slapping palms and looked as silly as white men in suits do when they pretend to be black soul brothers. When not listening to this sort of speech, we faced a much smaller man with a row of big fine points in a plastic case in his breast pocket, otherwise known as a nerd pack explaining to us how to convert a semi-annual bond yield to an annual bond yield. The guys in the back row didn't like that. Fuck the fucking bond math, they said. Tell us about the jungle. Why Solomon let it happen, I still don't understand. The firm's management created the training program, then walked away. In the ensuing anarchy, the bad drove out the good, the big drove out the small, and the brawn drove out the brains. There was a single trait common to denizens of the back row. They were victims of the myth, especially popular at Solomon Brothers, that a traitor is a savage and a great traitor is a great savage. This wasn't exactly correct. The trading floor held evidence to that effect, but it also held evidence to the contrary. People believed whatever they wanted to. There was another cause for the hooliganism. The winners of the Solomon interviewing process were pitted against one another in the classroom. In short, the baddest of the bad were competing for jobs. Contrary to what we expected when we arrived, we were not assured of employment. Look to your left and look to your right, more than one speaker said. In a year, one of those people will be out on the street. Across the top of the job placement blackboard appeared the name of each department on the trading floor. Municipal bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds, etc., Along the side of the board was each office in the firm, Atlanta, Dallas, New York, etc. The trainee was driven to despair by the thought that he might land somewhere awful in the matrix, or nowhere at all. Trading mortgages in New York was mouth-wateringly good, but the absolute worst was the slot marked Equities in Dallas. Equities in Dallas became training program shorthand for just bury that lowest form of human scum where it will never be seen again. Within weeks after our arrival, the managers of each department had begun to debate our relative merits. But the managers were traitors at heart. They couldn't discuss a person, place, or thing without also trading it. So they began to trade trainees, like slaves. One day you'd see three of them leaning over the fat blue binder that held our photographs and resumes. The next day you'd hear that you'd been swapped for one front row person and one draft choice from the next training program. You needed a sponsor, one of 112 managing directors. There was one small problem, of course. Bosses were not always eager to befriend trainees. After all, what was in it for them? A managing director grew interested only if he believed you were widely desired. He won points when he spirited away a popular trainee from other managing directors. The approach of many a trainee, therefore, was to create the illusion of desirability. Then bosses wanted him not for any sound reason, but simply because other bosses wanted him. A few weeks into the training program, I made a friend on the trading floor, though not in the area in which I wanted to work. That friend pressed for me to join his department. I let other trainees know I was pursued. They told their friends on the trading floor, who in turn became curious. Eventually the man I wanted to work for overheard others talking about me and asked me to breakfast. Within the training class, a dispute arose over whether, under the circumstances, groveling was acceptable. Each trainee had to decide for himself. Thus was born the great divide. Those who chose to put on a full court grovel found seats in the front of the classroom, where they sat, lips puckered, through the entire five-month program. Those who treasured their pride feigned cool indifference by sitting in the back row and hurling paper wads at managing directors. I considered myself an exception, of course. 
I was accused by some of being a front row person because I asked too many questions. I lamely compensated for my curiosity by hurling a few paper wads at important traders. And my stock rose dramatically in the back row when I was thrown out of class for reading the newspaper while a trader spoke. Of all exceptions, however, the Japanese were the greatest. The Japanese undermined any analysis of our classroom culture. All six of them sat in the front row and slept. Their leader was a man named Yoshi. Each morning and afternoon, the back row boys made bets on how many minutes it would take Yoshi to fall asleep. Yoshi was their hero. A small cheer would go up in the back row when Yoshi crashed, partly because someone had just won a pile of money, but also an appreciation of any man with the balls to fall asleep in the front row. The Solomon Brothers training program was, without a doubt, the finest start to a career on Wall Street. Upon completion, a trainee could take his experience and cash it in for twice the salary on any other Wall Street trading floor. He had achieved, by the standards of Wall Street, technical mastery of his subject. Over three months, leading salesmen, traders, and financiers shared their experiences with the class. They trafficked in unrefined street wisdom. How money travels around the world, any way it wants. How a trader feels and behaves, any way he wants. And how to schmooze a customer. After three months in the class, trainees circulated wearily around the trading floor every afternoon for two months more. All the while, there was a hidden agenda: to Solomonize the trainee. The trainee was made to understand first that inside Solomon Brothers, he was, as a trader once described us. Lower than whale shit on the bottom of the ocean floor, and second, that lying under whale shit at Solomon Brothers was like rolling in clover compared to not being at Solomon Brothers at all. Each day after class, around three o'clock, we were pressured to move from the training class to the trading floor on the forty-first floor. The trading floor, Power Central, was about a third the length of a football field and was lined with connected desks. Traders sitting elbow to elbow formed a human chain. Between the rows of desks, there was not enough space for two people to pass each other without first turning sideways. On braver days, you cruised the trading floor to find a manager who would take you under his wing, a mentor, better known to us as a rabbi. You also went to the trading floor to learn. Your first impulse was to step into the fray, select a likely teacher, and present yourself for instruction. Unfortunately, it wasn't so easy. First, a trainee by definition had nothing of merit to say, and second, the trading floor was a minefield of large men on short fuses, just waiting to explode if you so much as breathed in their direction. If you happened to step on a mine, then the conversation went something like this: "Me, hello, trader, what fucking rock did you crawl out from under?" Hey Joe, hey Bob, check out this guy's suspenders. Me reddening. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Trader, what the fuck do you think this is? A charity? I'm busy. Me, can I help in any way? Trader, give me a burger with ketchup. So I watched my step. There were a million little rules to obey. I knew none of them. Salesmen, traders, and managers swarmed over the floor. And at first, I could not tell them apart. Sure, I knew the basic differences: salesmen talked to investors, traders made bets, and managers smoked cigars. But other than that, I was lost. Most of the men were on two phones at once. Most of the men stared at small green screens full of numbers. They'd shout into one phone, then into the other, then at someone across the row of trading desks, then back into the phones, then point to the screen and scream "fuck." Thirty seconds was considered a long attention span. I did what every trainee did. I sidled up to some busy person without saying a word and became the invisible man. That it was perfectly humiliating was, of course, precisely the point. Sometimes I'd wait for an hour before my existence was formally acknowledged. Other times, a few minutes. But once I'd sidled up, it was difficult to leave without first being officially recognized. To leave was to admit defeat in this peculiar ritual of making myself known. Did I grow more comfortable on the trading floor over time? I suppose. 
I could see certain developments in myself. One day I was out playing the invisible man, feeling the warmth of the whale shit, and thinking that no one in life was lower than I. Onto the floor rushed a member of the corporate finance department. It must have been his first trip down from his glass box office, and he looked one way and then the other in the midst of the bedlam. Someone bumped into him and sharply told him to watch his step. You could see him thinking that the gaze of the whole world was on him, and he started to panic. Then I thought a nasty thought, a truly unforgivable thought, but it showed I was coming along. What a wimp, I thought. He doesn't have a fucking clue. One morning, John Goodfriend arrived to speak to the class. I hardly expected to hear anything new, but I thought I might learn something indirectly, for he was a man who was said to have stamped his personality onto an institution. His faults as well as his virtues were those of Solomon Brothers. Goodfriend possessed a statesmanlike calmness. He was so intensely calm and deliberate that he made you nervous and suspicious. He paused interminably after each question we asked him. He really seemed to want to know what we were thinking. When a trainee asked him about Solomon Brothers' policy towards charity, Goodfriend, with furrowed brow, after standing silent for an uncomfortably long time, said that charity was a very difficult issue, and he would appreciate our input. The statesman's veneer was a pleasant departure from the gruff, foul-mouthed traitor that people expected John Goodfriend to be. He was round like Churchill, with the thinning white hair of Harry Truman, and the grandeur, if not the height, of De Gaulle. But what had become of the man who claimed to stand ready each morning to bite the ass off a bear? Where was the man who was known around Wall Street for his brutal power plays? The man whose very name struck terror in the hearts of managing directors? We didn't know, and I'm not sure we wanted to find out. After telling us nothing much, but showing us what a world-class financial celebrity looked like up close, he left. As the training program neared its conclusion, the backroom game of liars poker grew. Bond trading had captured the imaginations of more than half the men in the class. Instead of saying buy and sell like normal human beings, they said bid and offer. At the front of the classroom each morning, a young hopeful shouted, "I'll bid you a quarter for your bagel." Bonds, bonds, and more bonds. Anyone who did not want to trade them for a living wanted to sell them. This group now included several women, who had initially hoped to trade. At Solomon Brothers, men traded, women sold. No one ever questioned the Solomon ordering of the sexes, but the immediate consequences of the prohibition of women in trading was clear to all. It kept women farther from power. A trader placed bets in the markets on behalf of Solomon Brothers. A salesman was the trader's mouthpiece to most of the outside world. The salesman spoke with institutional investors such as pension funds, insurance companies, and savings and loans. The minimum skills required for the two jobs were quite different. Traders required market savvy. Salesmen required interpersonal skills. But the very best traders were also superb salesmen, for they had to persuade a salesman to persuade his customers to buy bond X or sell bond Y. And the very best salesmen were superb traders. And found customers virtually giving their portfolios over to them to manage. The difference between a trader and a salesman was more than a matter of mere function. The traders ruled the shop, and it wasn't hard to see why. A salesman's year-end bonus was determined by traders. A trader's bonus was determined by the profits on his trading books. A salesman had no purchase on a trader, while a trader had complete control over a salesman. Not surprisingly. Young salesmen dashed around the place, looking cowed and frightened, while young traders smoked cigars. That the tyranny of the trader was institutionalized shouldn't surprise anyone. Traders were the people closest to the money. The firm's top executives were traders. John Goodfriend himself had been a trader. Good bond traders had fast brains and enormous stamina. They watched the markets twelve and sometimes sixteen hours a day, and not just the market and bonds. They watched dozens of financial and commodity markets, stocks, oil, natural gas, currencies, and anything else that might, in some way, influence the bond market. They sat down in their chairs at 7 a.m. and stayed put until dark. 
I quickly came to the conclusion that I could never be a bond trader, from having met a great number of them and not finding one who bore the slightest resemblance to me. We had nothing in common. That made me, by default, a salesman. I found imagining myself as a bond salesman only marginally more plausible than imagining myself as a bond trader. More different types of people succeeded on the trading floor than I initially supposed. Some of the traders were truly awful human beings. They sacked others to promote themselves. They harassed women. They humiliated trainees. They didn't have customers. They had victims. Others were naturally extremely admirable characters. They inspired those around them. They treated their customers almost fairly. They were kind to trainees. The point is that it didn't matter one bit whether a trader was good or evil, as long as he was that most revered of all species, a big swinging dick. If he could make millions of dollars come out of his phones, he became a big swinging dick. After the sale of a big block of bonds and the deposit of a few hundred thousand dollars into the Solomon Till, a managing director called whoever was responsible to confirm his identity. Hey, you big swinging dick! Way to be! To this day, the phrase brings to my mind the image of an elephant's trunk swaying from side to side. Swish, swash! Nothing in the jungle got in the way of a big swinging dick. That was the prize we coveted. Everyone wanted to be a big swinging dick, even the women. Big swinging dickettes. Christ, even front row people hoped to be big swinging dicks. Because the forty-first floor was the chosen home of the firm's most ambitious people, and because there were no rules governing the pursuit of profit and glory, the men who worked there, including the more bloodthirsty, had a hunted look about them: eat or be eaten. I sat wide-eyed when these people came to speak to the class and observed a behavioral smorgasbord, the likes of which I had never before encountered, except in fiction. And so it was in this frame of mind. That I first watched the human piranha in action. The human piranha was a bond salesman, and he came to tell us about government bonds. He was the only bond salesman who made traders nervous, because he generally knew their job better than they did, and if they screwed up by giving him a wrong price, he usually made a point of humiliating them on the hoot and holler, a system-wide loudspeaker. It gave other salespeople great satisfaction to watch him do this. The human piranha was short and square. The most unusual thing about him was the frozen expression on his face. His dark eyes rarely moved, and out of his mouth came a steady stream of bottom-line analysis and profanity. The piranha that day began by devouring the government of France. The French government had issued a bond known as the Giscard. Yes, the one described by Tom Wolfe in the Bonfire of the Vanities. Wolfe learned of the Giscard from a Solomon trader. In fact, to research his fictional bond salesman. Wolf had come to the forty-first floor and sat spitting distance from the human piranha. The French had raised about a billion dollars in 1978 with the bond. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that the bond was, under certain conditions, exchangeable into gold at thirty-two dollars an ounce. The fucking frogs are getting their faces ripped off," said the piranha, meaning that the French were losing a lot of money on the bond issue. Now that the bond had indeed become convertible, and the price of gold was five hundred dollars an ounce, the stupidity of the fucking frogs disgusted the piranha. He associated it with their habit of quitting work at five p.m. The piranha didn't talk like a person. He said things like, "If you fucking buy this bond in a fucking trade, you're fucking fucked," and, "If you don't pay fucking attention to the fucking two year, you get your fucking face ripped off." Noun, verb, adjective, fucker, fuck, fucking. No part of speech was spared. The human piranha, a Harvard graduate, thought nothing of it. He was always like this. The human piranha turned out to be my favorite person on the forty-first floor. There was no bullshit about him. He was brutal, but also honest, and I think fair. The problems on forty-one were caused by people who were tough but unfair. You survived the human piranha by simply knowing what you were about. How, though, did you survive a trader who threw a phone at your head every other time you passed his desk? How did a woman cope with a married managing director who tried to seduce her whenever he found her alone? 
the training program wasn't a survival course, but sometimes a person came through who put the horrors of 41 into perspective. For me, it was a young bond salesman, just a year out of the training program and at work on 41, named Richard O'Grady. When O'Grady entered the classroom, the first thing he did was to have the video that usually recorded events shut off. Then he closed the door. Then he checked for eavesdroppers on the ledges outside the 23rd floor windows. Only then did he sit down. Only then did he tell us what we really wanted to know. So you want to know how to deal with those assholes, don't you, he said. Trainees sort of nodded their heads. O'Grady said he had discovered the secret earlier than most. When he was just starting out, he said, he had an experience that taught him a lesson. He had been a flunky for a senior bond salesman named Penn King, a tall, blonde, big-swinging dick, if ever there was one. One day, King told him to find prices on four bonds for a very large customer, Morgan Guarantee. O'Grady therefore asked the relevant trader for prices. When the trader saw him, however, he said, What the fuck do you want? Just a few prices, said O'Grady. I'm busy, said the trader. Oh well, thought O'Grady. I'll see if I can find the prices on the Quotron machine. As O'Grady fiddled with the keyboard of the Quotron, it resembles a personal computer, Penn King demanded the prices for his customer. O'Grady explained what had transpired between himself and the trader. Then this is what you do, you hear me, said a completely pissed off Penn King. You go over to that asshole and you say, look, asshole, since you were so fucking helpful the first time I asked, maybe you could give me the goddamn prices for Morgan Guarantee. So O'Grady went back to the trader. When he reached the trader, the trader rose to his feet and screamed, What the fuck are you doing back here? I told you, I am busy. Look, asshole, said O'Grady, since you were so fucking helpful the first time I asked, maybe you would be so kind to give me the goddamn prices now. The trader fell back in his chair. O'Grady was, conveniently, about twice the size of the trader. He stood over the trader. Asshole, he shouted again, for effect. O'Grady walked back to his seat to a standing ovation from three or four other bond salesmen who had watched the scene develop, and a big grin from Penn. Sure enough, not two minutes later, the trader came to him with the prices. And after that, said O'Grady, to a spellbound training program, he didn't fuck with me again. As you might imagine, this threw the back row into frenzied delight. It had them stomping on the floor like bleacher bums after a grand slam. What was the secret to dealing with the assholes? Lift weights or learn karate, said O'Grady. As if to confirm this impression, following on the heels of O'Grady came the mortgage trading department. Every firm on Wall Street has its baddest dudes, and these were ours. They were known for hurling phones at the heads of trainees and were said to have installed extra-long cords to increase their range. In spite of my craven panic in the presence of mortgage traders, I was curious about their business and their boss, Louis Ranieri. All Solomon trainees were curious about Ranieri. Ranieri was the wild and woolly genius, the Solomon legend who began in the mailroom, worked his way onto the trading floor, and created a market in America for mortgage bonds. Ranieri was Solomon, and Solomon was Ranieri. Dozens of trainees wanted to trade mortgage bonds. In the end, five were chosen. I was not, which was fine by me. I was shipped to London to become a bond salesman. In due course, I shall return to my private education on the London trading floor. But here it is time to follow the story of Ranieri and the mortgage traders. For not only were they the soul of the firm, they were a microcosm of Wall Street in the 1980s. The mortgage market was one of two or three textbook cases that illustrated the change sweeping the world of finance. It was January 1985, and Matty Oliva was fresh from Harvard University and the Solomon Brothers training program. The good news was he had landed a plum job on the mortgage trading desk. The bad news was that for his first full year on the desk, he would be an object of abuse. The senior mortgage traders maintained that abuse led to enlightenment. It purged trainees of pretension and made them realize they were the lowest of all God's creations. The traders were to blame for the awful thing about to happen to Matty Oliva. A couple of traders regularly asked Matty to fetch their lunch. They'd holler at him, 
Hey, geek, how about some food? In their less ornery moments, they said, almost politely, About that time, ain't it, Maddie? There was no need to be polite to Maddie, because Maddie was a slave. There was no need to tell him exactly what to get, because as every trainee knew, mortgage traders ate anything at any time. Just as some people are mean drunks, mortgage traders were mean gluttons. Nothing angered them more than being without food, unless it was being interrupted while they ate. In other words, they were not the sort of hyperthyroid fat people who meekly sip Diet Cokes all day and prompt one to ask, so how did he get fat? He never eats. Nor were they the sort of jolly fat people, like Ed McMahon, who are loved because they don't threaten anybody. Mortgage traders were the sort of fat people who grunt from the belly and throw their weight around, like sumo wrestlers. When asked to find food, a trainee on the mortgage desk simply brought back as much of everything as he could carry. On one fateful January day, the beleaguered Maddie climbed the five flights of stairs from the trading floor to the cafeteria. Maddie quickly filled as many plastic trays as he could carry with fries, burgers, Cokes, candy, and a couple of dozen chocolate chip cookies, products of a kitchen known throughout Wall Street for the regular warnings it received from the health inspectors. Then he sneaked past the security guard without paying. Call it an assertion of self. Call it a little cry of freedom from a much-abused soul. Stealing food wasn't Maddie's big mistake. His big mistake was to brag to one of the fat traders how he had done it. That afternoon, Maddie received a phone call from a man who claimed to work for the Special Projects Division of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC, this man explained, had been granted jurisdiction over Wall Street's cafeterias, and he was investigating a reported theft of three trays of food from the Solomon Brothers cafeteria. Ha, 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 said Maddie. Very funny. No, said the officer. We're very serious. The ethical standards of Wall Street have to be monitored at all levels. Maddie chuckled again and hung up. Maddie arrived the next morning to find Michael Mortara, a Solomon Brothers managing director, waiting for him. Mortara was the head of mortgage trading. Mortara looked upset. He asked Maddie into his office. Is it true that you have been stealing food from our cafeteria? He asked. Maddie nodded. What were you thinking? I really don't know what is going to happen now. Look, go back to your desk and I'll get back to you. This is a problem, said Mortara. The rest of the day, Maddie looked as frantic as a lottery winner who had lost his ticket. Although he was a young, much-abused trainee trader, he was nevertheless on the verge of big swinging dickhood. By his fourth year, if he were good at his job, he would be making a million dollars before taxes. It was a good time and a great place to be 22 years old. Now this, busted by the SEC in the cafeteria. The next morning, Maddie was told to report to good friend's office. Any hope Maddie nourished about the reason for the meeting died when he saw Mortara seated beside good friend in the office. Good friend went on for some time about how unfunny it was to steal cheeseburgers from the cafeteria. Then he said, Matthew, I have just concluded a long and painful meeting with the Solomon Brothers Executive Committee, and we've decided to let you stay for now. All I can say now is that there are other issues we need to iron out with the SEC. We'll be back to you. Matty figured his career was ruined. When he returned to his seat on the mortgage desk, he appeared to have witnessed the end of the world. For the 20 or so other mortgage traders, the sight was too much to bear. They tried to hide their Snickers behind Quotron machines. Maddie had been made the victim of what was known in the department as a goof. Wall Street brings together borrowers of money with lenders. Until the spring of 1978, when Solomon Brothers formed Wall Street's first mortgage security department, the term borrower referred to large corporations and to federal, state, and local governments. It did not include homeowners. But the fastest growing group of borrowers was neither governments nor corporations, but homeowners. The majority of home loans to average Americans were made by the savings and loan industry, which received layers of government support and protection. Nudged by a friendly public policy, savings and loans grew, and the mortgage department surpassed the combined United States stock markets as the largest capital market in the world. Nevertheless, 
before 1978. On Wall Street, it was flaky to think that home mortgages could be big business. Everything about them seemed small and insignificant, at least to people who routinely advised CEOs and heads of state. The typical savings and loan president was the sort of fellow who sponsored a float in the town parade. He wore polyester suits. That said it all, didn't it? A trader would stand up and shout across the trading floor, I got 10 million IBM eight and a halfs at 101, and I want these fuckers moved out the door now. Never in a million years could he imagine himself shouting, I got the $62,000 home mortgage of Mervyn K. Finkelberger. It has 20 years left on it. He's paying 9% interest, and it's a nice little three-bedroom affair just outside Norwalk. Goodbye, too. A single home mortgage was a messy investment for Wall Street, which was used to dealing in bigger numbers. No trader or investor wanted to poke around suburbs to find out whether the homeowner to whom he had just lent money was creditworthy. At the very least, a mortgage had to be pooled with other mortgages of other homeowners. Traders and investors would trust statistics and buy into a pool of several thousand mortgage loans made by a savings and loan, of which, by the laws of probability, only a small fraction should default. Pieces of paper could be issued that entitled the bearer to a pro rata share of the cash flows from the pool, a guaranteed slice of a fixed pie. Thus standardized, the pieces of paper could be traded. Robert Dahl, a Solomon Brothers partner, saw the wave coming and produced a three-page memo summarizing the market for the Solomon Brothers Executive Committee. This memo convinced John Goodfriend to establish a mortgage department with Dahl as the manager. It was the spring of 1978, and Goodfriend had just been appointed chairman of the firm by his predecessor, William Solomon, the son of one of the firm's three founding fathers. Dahl acted as a financier to negotiate with banks and thrifts to persuade them to sell their loans. These loans would be transformed into mortgage bonds. Dahl needed a big-name trader to inspire confidence in investors. Dahl had to borrow a proven winner from either the corporate or the government bond trading desks. He got his first choice, Louis Ranieri, a 30-year-old utility bond trader. Ranieri's move to the mortgage department was a seminal event on the eve of the golden age of the bond trader. With his appointment in mid-1978, the story of the mortgage market, as it is conventionally told within Solomon Brothers, commences. Dahl knows precisely why he selected Ranieri. Louis, he says, was not just a trader. He had the mentality and the will to create a market. He was tough-minded. He didn't mind hiding a million-dollar loss from a manager, if that's what it took. He didn't let morality get in the way. Well, morality is not the right word, but you know what I mean. When John Goodfriend told Louis he would be joining Dahl as head trader in the embryonic mortgage security department, Louis panicked. In Louis's view, there would be no chunk of bonus money at the end of the year in the mortgage department. In retrospect, his fears look laughably absurd, but at the time of his appointment he felt cheated. Ranieri was a sophomore English major at St. John's College when he took a part-time job on the night shift in the Solomon Brothers' mailroom in 1968. The Solomon paycheck was $70 a week. Several months into his new job, he ran into money problems. His wife lay ill in the hospital, and the bills simply accumulated. Ranieri needed $10,000. He was 19 years old. He was finally forced to request a loan from the one Solomon partner he knew vaguely. You gotta remember, he says now, I was convinced, really convinced he was going to fire me. Instead, Solomon Brothers paid. There was no committee meeting to discuss whether this was appropriate. It was understood that the bill would be paid, for no reason other than it was the right thing to do. The act moved Ranieri deeply. When he speaks of loyalty, of the covenant between Solomon Brothers and the people who work for Solomon Brothers, it is that single generosity he remembers. From supervisor of the mailroom, he moved out to the clerical back office, which brought him directly in contact with traders. By 1974, he was sitting where he wanted, in the utility bond trader seat on the corporate bond desk. Up to the point of his transfer to the mortgage department, Ranieri had dominated every department he joined. The firm encouraged both aggression and ability. It made a point never to interfere with natural jungle forces. And in a matter of months after his appointment, power over the new mortgage department consolidated in Ranieri's hands. In February 1979, 
Goodfriend placed Ranieri officially in charge of the entire mortgage operation. For the next two and a half years, to everyone except the people inside, the department was more comical than practical. Ranieri created the trading desk in his own image. Italian, self-educated, loud, and fat. After a year of making no money and being the butt of ridicule within Solomon Brothers, mortgage trading looked doomed. A rift was growing between this small group of uneducated Italians and the rest of the firm. The mortgage traders deeply resented the corporate and government traders. Partly, it was a money problem. The Solomon compensation game has a political wild card in it. Year-end bonuses are not tied directly to one's profitability, but rather to the perception of one's value by the Solomon Brothers Compensation Committee. The resentment the mortgage department felt increased when it became known in early 1980. That those outside the department wanted it shut down. The mortgage department wasn't making money. The other mortgage units on Wall Street, Merrill Lynch, First Boston, Goldman Sachs, were stillborn. They closed almost before they had opened. The prevailing wisdom was that mortgages were not for Wall Street. Ranieri expanded his mortgage unit. Why? Who knows? Perhaps he had a crystal ball. Perhaps he figured that the larger his department grew. The harder it would be to dismantle. For whatever reason, Ranieri hired the fired mortgage salesmen from other firms, built his research department, and doubled the number of traders, and left the dormant mortgage finance department in place. He hired a phalanx of lawyers and lobbyists in Washington to work on legislation to increase the number of potential buyers of mortgage securities. The executive committee members of Solomon Brothers fought Ranieri's expansion. Because they decided the mortgage market was bad news, they didn't understand it. They didn't want to understand it. They just wanted out of it. They planned to sever the ties with the thrift industry and cut the lines of credit. Cutting off thrifts was the same as shutting down the mortgage department, since thrifts were the only buyers of mortgage bonds. I basically threw my body between the committee and the thrift industry, says Ranieri, allowing the expansion of his mortgage department. In all his decisions, Ranieri had the support of only one man, John Goodfriend. Ranieri built high walls to protect his people from hostile forces. The enemy was no longer his Wall Street competitors, for they had mostly disappeared. The enemy was Solomon Brothers. Lights began to flash on the mortgage trading desk in October 1981. On the other end of the telephones were nervous savings and loan presidents from across America, wanting to sell their loans. Every home in America, one trillion dollars worth of debt, seemed to be for sale. There were a thousand loan sellers and no buyers. Correction, one buyer, Louis Ranieri. All the traders had to do was open their mouths and swallow as much as they could. What was going on? From the moment Volcker fixed the money supply. And lifted interest rates in October 1979. Thrifts hemorrhaged money. The entire structure of home lending was on the verge of collapse. There was a time when it seemed that if nothing were done, all thrifts would go bankrupt. So on September 30th, 1981, Congress passed a nifty tax break, allowing thrifts to sell all their mortgage loans and put their cash to work for higher returns. Selling their mortgage loans led to hundreds of billions of dollars in turnover on Wall Street. The United States Congress had just rescued Ranieri and Company. The only fully staffed mortgage department on Wall Street was no longer awkward and expensive; it was a thriving monopoly. It rained gold on Solomon Brothers mortgage traders. Solomon Brothers was all of a sudden playing the role of a thrift. Solomon was exposed to the homeowner's ability to repay. A cautious man would have inspected the properties he was lending against, for nothing but property underpinned the loans. The notion of trusting the thrifts to value the property accurately gave Solomon's top brass the willies. Ranieri and Company intended to transform the home loans into bonds as soon as possible by taking them to the U.S. government for a guarantee. Then they could sell the bonds to Solomon's institutional investors as, in effect, U.S. government bonds. The thrifts paid a fee to have their mortgages guaranteed. The wonderfully spontaneous mortgage department was the place to be if your philosophy of life was ready, fire, aim. The payoff to the swashbuckling traders, by the standards of the time, 
was shockingly large. In 1982, coming off two and a half lean years, Louis Ranieri's mortgage department made $150 million. Although there are no official numbers, it is widely accepted at Solomon that Ranieri's traders made $200 million in 1983, $175 million in 1984, and $275 million in 1985. Louis Ranieri was the right man at the right place at the right time. Louis was willing to take positions on things he didn't fully understand, says one of his traders. He had a trader's instinct that he trusted. That was important. The attitude at Solomon was always, if you believe in it, go with it. But if it doesn't work, you're fucked. And Louis responded to this. Louis was not only willing to bet the ranch. His attitude was, sure, what the fuck? It's only a ranch. In 1983, with his department generating 40% of the firm's revenues, while no other department generated more than 10%, he was placed on the Solomon Brothers Executive Committee. He expanded by hiring more traders and moving into real estate mortgages. In 1986, Ranieri was named to the office of the chairman, directly beneath Goodfriend. As Louis grew wealthy, earning between 2 and $5 million in each of the golden years between 1982 and 1986, he continued to own four suits. A mortgage trader recalls, We used to kid him that he stood in line at the mail shop in Brooklyn to get his suits. They used to sell you a suit with a trip to Florida, a bottle of champagne, and food stamps, all for 99 bucks. As time passed, Ranieri grew less involved with the day-to-day decisions made on the trading desk. Louis was a brilliant big-picture guy. He was not, however, a brilliant detail guy. The traders were beginning to delve into the minutia of the mortgage market. The nature of the trader changed, says a longtime mortgage bond salesman. They wheeled in the rocket scientists. But the mortgage traders did not become correspondingly more refined in their behavior. For each step forward in market technology, they took a step backward in human evolution. As their numbers grew from 6 to 25, they became louder, ruder, fatter, and less concerned with their relations with the rest of the firm. Their culture was based on food, and as strange as that sounds, it was stranger still to those who watched mortgage traders eat. They began with a round of onion cheeseburgers, fetched by a trainee from the Trinity Deli at 8 a.m., One trader made enormous cartons of malted milk balls disappear in two gulps. Another sent trainees to buy $20 worth of candy for him every afternoon. Other traders swallowed small pizzas whole. Each Friday was food frenzy day, during which all trading ceased and eating commenced. Says a former trader, A customer would call in and ask us to bid or offer bonds, and you'd have to say, I'm sorry, but we're in the middle of the feeding frenzy. I'll have to call you back. The department, in short, looked far more like a fraternity than it did a division of a large corporation. The boss was at least partly responsible for the adolescent nature of his department. He wasn't just one of the boys, he was the ringleader. It was enjoyable to make more money than the rest of the firm, but it was sheer delight to make more money than the rest of the firm while you spent half your day playing practical jokes on your employees, eating and smoking big fat cigars. A trader recalls Ranieri marching out from his office onto the floor to talk to one of his young traders, Andrew Friedwald. He had this big smile on his face. He was standing real close to Andy and asking him how a deal was going. Andy was saying how he hoped to sell some bonds in Japan and London. And Louis just stood there nodding with this weird smile. Then Andy felt the joke. Louis was holding a Bic lighter right under Andy's balls. His pants were about to catch fire. Andy hit the roof. Ranieri was impulsive in a way that business school case studies seldom account for when they analyze managerial decision-making. Maria Sanchez recalls meeting Ranieri in a hallway during her first day in the Solomon Mortgage Finance Department as she was being given a tour of the firm. I had no idea who he was, she says. He came waddling down the hall like a penguin, waving one of his long swords. He kept a collection of swords in his office. He walked up to my tour guide and pointed to me with the sword and asked loudly, Who's this? We were introduced, and he asked, You Italian? I said, No, I was Cuban. I was wearing a blouse with a long string bow tie. 
Louis took out a pair of scissors and, with his big smile on his face, cut off my tie. He said he didn't like ties on women. He pulled a hundred dollar bill from his wallet and told me to buy a new shirt. I thought, Jesus, what have I gotten myself into? You couldn't put your finger on why, when two seemingly equal people sat in the same trading position, one made twenty million dollars and the other lost twenty million dollars. You couldn't always put your finger on losers, but you knew talent when you saw it. Howie Rubin had it. Louis Ranieri calls Rubin the most innately talented young trader I have ever seen. The other traders say he was the trader most like Louis Ranieri. In his first year out of the training program, 1983, Rubin made 25 million dollars. The several hundred million dollar question that has never been answered by the management of Solomon Brothers was first raised by Howie Rubin: Who really made that money? In Rubin's view, it was Howie Rubin. In John Goodfriend's view, it was Solomon Brothers. The first two years out of the training program, Howie Rubin, like all trainees, was placed in a compensation bracket. In his first year, he was paid ninety thousand dollars, the most permitted a first-year trader. In 1984, his second year, Rubin made thirty million dollars trading, and was paid one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, the most permitted a second-year trader. In the beginning of 1985, he quit Solomon Brothers and moved to Merrill Lynch for a three-year guarantee, a minimum of one million dollars a year, plus a percentage of his trading profits. Who could blame him? His fellow traders understood. John Goodfriend, although himself a trader by training, did not grasp the contradictions inherent in his compensation system. Goodfriend had no intention of paying anyone a cut. He entertained a notion that X amount was enough, and anyway, Solomon Brothers, not Howie Rubin, had made that twenty-five million dollars trading. Goodfriend openly criticized what he considered the overweening greed of the younger generation. In 1985, he told a reporter from Business Week, "I don't understand what goes on inside these pointy little heads." His hypocrisy was noted and resented by the mortgage traders. It was easy for Goodfriend to say money didn't matter. He paid himself more than any chief executive on Wall Street. The Howie Rubin legend drew into mortgage trading people who planned to leave just as soon as they got their three million dollar contracts elsewhere. A whole new attitude towards working at Solomon Brothers was born. Hit and run. And that is how Solomon Brothers and the mortgage trading desk in particular became a nursery for the rest of Wall Street. Traders streamed out of the place in ever-increasing numbers. From the point of view of other firms, Solomon Mortgage traders were cheap at any price. These people provided entry to an enormous market from which a firm would otherwise be excluded. The bond market and the people market sought their respective equilibriums, and in two years, 1986 to 1988, the mortgage department of Solomon Brothers disintegrated. With the million dollars Solomon saved by not meeting Howie Rubin's demands, it bought a dozen new Rubins. However, they didn't make nearly as much money for Solomon Brothers. Now they had to compete with the best elsewhere. By allowing dozens of able mortgage traders to fertilize the mortgage departments of other firms, Solomon Brothers let slip through its fingers the rarest and most valuable asset a Wall Street firm can possess—a monopoly. The transfer of skills and information probably cost Solomon Brothers hundreds of millions of dollars. The bad times befalling the mortgage department were characteristic of business throughout the firm. The year 1986 was a poor one for Solomon Brothers, and 1987 was worse, as revenues ceased to grow and costs spun out of control. In an effort to instill management control, Goodfriend created a wealth of new titles. A board of directors of Solomon Brothers was born. Consisting mainly of former traders, on top of the board of directors sat another new level of management, called the office of the chairman. To the office of the chairman, Goodfriend appointed two former traders and a former salesman, Louis Ranieri, Bill Vute, and Tom Strauss. Each was asked to detach himself from the turf battles he had previously engaged in, and to concern himself with the overall welfare of the firm. It was a nice idea. 
The divisiveness was simply a carryover from the battle between the three pillars of debt, with Strauss representing the government department, Vute representing the corporate department, and Ranieri representing the mortgage department. As a member of the government department put it, around here you are in the Strauss family, the Ranieri family, or the Vute family. The government trading desk was a counterpoint to the visible gluttony and ethnicity of the mortgage department. Government traders could have been mistaken for socially conscious East Coast wasps, had they only been a bit more repressed. Tom Strauss, their leader, was tall, thin, and perpetually tanned. The mortgage traders resented this. They disliked what they interpreted as Strauss's overhead smash of Solomon's Jewish culture. The two vices of which the mortgage department was free, hypocrisy and pretension, were the vices they least tolerated in others. The difference between Strauss and Ranieri, says one trader, that's easy. Strauss wouldn't stoop to use the men's room on the trading floor. He'd go upstairs. Louis would piss on your desk. Tom Strauss, says Ranieri, wishes more than anything he wasn't Jewish. Ever since he joined the firm, there's been a joke that some terrible Jewish couple had stolen Tommy from his crib. And, says one of Ranieri's senior traders, what Strauss hated about Louis was that he was fat, uneducated, and lacking finesse. Strauss didn't care about Louis's profits. He didn't like Louis's lack of couth. The Strauss family, the government department, of which I was to become a member, had strong professional objections to the mortgage department. They disapproved of what they thought were the excesses of the mortgage group. The food frenzies and all that fatness pointed to a more fundamental problem. Costs were most out of control in the mortgage department. There had been so much revenue in the mortgage department between 1981 and 1986 that costs were a trivial issue. But as revenues subsided, costs all of a sudden mattered too. A managing director of government sales was moved to the mortgage department in late 1985 and simultaneously put in charge of Solomon's expense committee. This wasn't just a coincidence. Someone had to control these people. Vute's feelings towards Ranieri were more a mystery than Strauss's, but then Vute himself was more a mystery. While the other managing directors swarmed across the 41st floor trading room, Vute was an invisible link high in the chain of authority. He had an office on the 40th floor. He appeared occasionally in the newspapers, but no one actually saw him. In spite of his reclusiveness, the initial move to dismantle the mortgage department came from his corporate bond family. At the insistence of Vute and Strauss, a corporate bond managing director named Mark Smith entered the mortgage department at the end of 1985. You could call him a spy, says one mortgage trader. You might call him a Trojan horse, says another. You can't call him a Trojan horse, says a third, because we all knew what was inside. The question which had been on the tips of mortgage tongues during all this turmoil was voiced for the first time. Where was Louis? Why would he let Smith dismantle his department? The air was poisoned. In May of 1987, John Goodfriend told Solomon's 112 managing directors at the annual managing directors weekend, We created an office of the chairman because running Solomon Brothers is beyond the scope of any one man. As with any team, the challenge is to share the tasks, bring a diversity of opinion and insights, and yet work with a singularity of purpose. I am very pleased with how the group is gelling. Two months later, on July 16, 1987, he fired Ranieri during a meeting in uptown Manhattan. The meeting lasted about ten minutes and left Ranieri stunned. When asked why he was fired, Ranieri says, I still don't know. When Ranieri moved to adjourn the meeting, and go collect his belongings, Goodfriend told him he wouldn't be permitted in the building. Clearly the thought of a coup, or a general strike, had crossed Goodfriend's mind, as large numbers of Solomon employees owed their chief allegiance to Ranieri. When news reached the mortgage desk, it was clear to everyone what would happen next. The Ranieri family would be purged. Over a period of a few months, the firm fired what was left of the old guard on the mortgage trading desk. The lone trader of Italian descent left on the desk was Paul Longinotti, who appeared at work one day wearing a button that said, Fire me, I'm Italian. 
all the traders found better jobs at other firms. Solomon Brothers' expertise fertilized the rest of Wall Street. The ignorance about mortgage bonds at the top of the firm was truly remarkable. After the purge, good friend Vute and Strauss arranged to have a private seminar given by the head of Solomon Bond Research. The subject, an introduction to mortgage securities. Vute was eventually named head of mortgage trading. Louis Ranieri opened his own firm half a mile north of Solomon Brothers. This one really was called Ranieri and Company. Soon after his dismissal, a confused Ranieri had lunch with the Solomon partner who had dragged him kicking and screaming into mortgages, Bob Dahl. Dahl says, I have two theories why John fired Louis so soon after he promoted him. One is that John realized all of a sudden he had made a huge error, that Louis was too parochial and would put his department first, even if he was vice chairman of the firm. The second theory is that the office of the chairman got sick of listening to Louis. Louis dominates a meeting. He's not the kind of guy who likes to hear himself talk, but he has all these passionate beliefs. It's too bad that Strauss, Vute, and Goodfriend couldn't take it, because they could have benefited from listening to Louis. Ranieri has never relinquished his loyal notion of the firm, formed when the faceless, nameless partner paid his wife's hospital bills for no reason, when the firm was run by men who said, it is more important to be a good man than a good manager, and meant it. Ranieri prefers to think of Solomon Brothers as temporarily in the hands of strangers to its culture. The only way you can understand what happened, says Ranieri, is that John Goodfriend was not in control. Strauss was in control. Strauss wanted absolute power. They managed to destroy a colossus in a year. John would have never done that to himself if he were making the decisions. I can't imagine what Strauss and Vute said to John to get him to do what he did. They never understood that the greatness of the firm was its culture. They shattered the culture. And with that, a 19-year journey from a Wall Street mailroom to a Wall Street boardroom ended. A geek is a carnival performer who bites the heads off live chickens and snakes. Upon my arrival in London, a trader told me that a geek was both A, any person who sucks farts from swans, and B, a person immediately out of the training program and in a disgusting larval state between trainee and man. I, he said, was a geek. By December 1985, having served my time as both a waiter and a punching bag for traders in New York, I was happy to stop being a trainee, even if it meant becoming a geek. If you wished to detach yourself from the soul of Solomon Brothers, London was the only place to go. Everywhere else, the standards were set by the 41st floor, in the American branches and also in Tokyo. But the older Europeans who staffed the London office of Solomon were freedom fighters. The Europeans set the pace. The Europeans had a reputation, probably exaggerated, of sleeping late, taking long liquid lunches, and stumbling through their afternoons. The source of this reputation was, as ever, the 41st floor in New York. One New York trader referred to them as Monty Python's flying investment bankers. The colorful and loud clash between their culture and the culture of the imported American management was a dust cloud behind which a geek could hide and retain a measure of personal freedom. I was a geek salesman, one of twelve from my training class, airmailed business class to London. The twelve sales units in the London office were merely extensions of the New York parent operations. One unit sold corporate bonds, a second mortgage bonds, a third government bonds, a fourth American equities, and so on. What I would sell had been decided for me while I was in the training program. I was committed to the bond options and futures sales department. This was a lucky break, because no one else wanted me except the equity department. On my first day in London, I introduced myself to the London manager, Stu Williker. Before I arrived, his unit consisted of three other salesmen. Williker was another lucky break. He hadn't caught the Solomon disease. He'd been in London four years, but refused to forget that Bald Knob, Arkansas was his birthplace. That was refreshing. More to the point, he had taken one look at the mass of unwritten and written rules that govern the behavior of most Solomon employees and had chosen to have nothing to do with them. He valued his liberty. 
he paid almost no attention to what he was told to do and encouraged his charges to intransigence. His was the most profitable unit in the office, year in and year out, and I am sure it was because its members were left with room to think for themselves. Thinking as yet was a feat beyond my reach. I had no base, no grounding. My only hope was to watch the salesmen around me and gather what advice I could. Two days after I'd found a seat on the London trading floor, with the phones going berserk with Frenchmen and Englishmen wanting to gamble in the great American bull market, I received my first piece of advice. The young man directly across from me, a member of my unit, whom I would spend the next two years gazing upon in wonderment, leaned over and whispered, Want to know a layup? Short the stock of Solomon Brothers. A layup, it should be said, was jargon for a gamble that was sure to succeed. And to sell short is to sell a security that you don't own, hoping that it will decline in price and that you can buy it back later at a lower price. To short our own stock would be to bet on its taking a nosedive. I should have gasped and recoiled in horror. First, shorting the stock of your own company is illegal. And second, it didn't sound like such a great idea. The firm was having the second most profitable year in its and Wall Street's history. My friend, who goes here by his chosen pseudonym of Dash Riprock, didn't mean I should actually do the deed. He was simply making a point, stating a fact, in his inimitably succinct style. He had sized me up, he later explained, and had decided to take me under his wing. This meant he would occasionally cast in my direction the pearls of wisdom he had accumulated in nine months on the job. He was an American, and only twenty-three, two years younger than I. Still, in the way of the world, he was light years ahead of me. Dash Riprock was a proven moneymaker. Dash's point on this occasion was that Solomon Brothers was a poor investment in spite of all the vital signs of the company's being healthy. This, I was to learn, is the best time to short, the moment before business turns sour. But how did he know that the time had come for Solomon? As a geek, you see, I was like a newly elected president. I wasn't expected to know anything, except that I didn't know and that it wasn't my fault. So I asked, why? To support his case, Dash raised his index finger, like a Roman orator, and said, Consider the book and the bowl. The book and the bowl. Solomon was then celebrating its 75th anniversary. To commemorate the great day, all employees received two gifts, a large silver-plated bowl with the name of the company inscribed on its side, and a book. The bowl was good for putting Doritos in. The book called Solomon Brothers, Advanced to Leadership, was a selective history of the company that had as its sole purpose the glorification of the people on top. Even to a trainee, the book was a ridiculous cover-up job. The firm had advanced to leadership, but not as one big happy family. At that point, there were more skeletons in the firm than there was closet space to hold them. Of course, Little of the firm's dark past and present appeared in the official sanitized history. But the disinformation was not what bothered Dash about the book and the bowl. Once you knew the truth about the firm, you realized it was far better to disinform than to inform. What bothered Dash was that Solomon Brothers had actually spent money to make these things. A book and a bowl? Who gave a shit, he said. He'd rather have the money. What's more, he added... The people who worked at Solomon Brothers in the old days would have never done such a thing. They, too, would rather have had the money. The book in the bowl violated what Dash considered to be the Solomon ethic. Dash was fond of saying that as a geek I bore the stamp of whomever I had last spoken with. I was, he felt, uncommonly soft-brained upon my arrival. If I had last spoken to the mortgage bond trader, I would be on the phones to people to say what a good deal mortgage bonds were. If I had last spoken to a corporate bond trader, I would think that the latest issue of IBM bonds was a gold mine. Unfortunately, Dash did not make real-time observations about my character. He let me know of my flaws only after they had wrought a great deal of damage. Still, I relied heavily on Dash and on the other members of our unit, a woman and two men. We sat at a single desk, 
divided artificially to accommodate five. We had a hundred telephone lines. Each line was a channel through which money, tasteless jokes, and rumors flowed. If you ever care to see how all the world's most awful jokes spread, spend a day on a bond trading desk. Several dozen phone lights flash continually on our telephone boards. European investors wanted to place their bets on the American bond market from eight in the morning until eight at night. There was good reason for their eagerness. The American bond market was shooting through the roof. The attraction of options and futures, our specialty item, was that they offered both liquidity and fantastic leverage. For a tiny down payment, a buyer of a futures contract takes the same risk as in owning a large number of bonds. In a heartbeat, he can double or lose his money. In spite of the responsibility implied by my job, I was ignorant and malleable when I advised my first customers. I was an amateur pharmacologist, prescribing drugs without a license. The people who suffered as a result were, of course, my customers. I couldn't help noticing that they were different from the customers of established salesmen. Mine were small institutional investors, defined as those who, on each trade, would commit only a few million. The other three salesmen in my unit were speaking almost exclusively to insurance companies, money managers, and European central banks that could commit fifty to a hundred million dollars in a matter of seconds. The largest of these controlled perhaps twenty billion dollars in investable funds. There was an excellent reason I had the customers I did. I was dangerous. The plan was for me to learn on the small clients, so that if disaster struck, the effect on the overall business of Solomon Brothers would be negligible. It was assumed that I might well put a customer or two out of business. There was a quaint expression when a customer went under. He was said to have been blown up. That was part of being a geek. A few days after I'd arrived, I was told by my jungle guide to start smiling and dialing. Cold calling was not my idea of fun. When my jungle guide saw I was having no success, he finally gave me the phone number of a man named Herman at the London branch of an Austrian bank. This was convenient for everyone. Herman wanted to be sold to by Solomon Brothers, because he had only a few million dollars to play with. No one else at Solomon Brothers wanted to sell to Herman. Poor Herman never knew what hit him. I proposed lunch, and he accepted. He was a tall, gruff German who thought he was very, very smart. It was my job to encourage him in this view, since the smarter he felt, the more he traded, and the more he traded, the more business he could give me. In spite of his cunning, Herman didn't know a geek when he saw one. I explained to him how the two of us could make a fortune. Solomon Brothers was full of shrewd, knowing people. I said, and we would draw from their reservoir of ideas. At the end of the lunch, during which we drank a bottle of wine, he decided he could do business with me. But Michael, remember, he said several times, we need good ideas. A corporate bond trader was waiting for me, like an unfed house pet, when I returned to the office. As it happened, he had a great idea for me and my new customer. He had been watching the euro bond market all day and had noticed that AT and T's thirty-year bonds had become really cheap. The trader said the street, meaning other traders, was undervaluing AT and T's. What I should tell my new client to do, he said, was to buy the AT and T's. And at the same time, sell short thirty-year U.S. Treasury bonds. It sounded complicated. I wanted to be careful. I asked if the strategy was risky. Don't worry, he said. Your guy will make money. I have never done this thing before, but it sounds like a good idea," said the still tipsy Herman when I told him. "Do three million. My first order. I felt thrilled, and immediately shouted over to the London corporate bond trader. You can do three million of the AT and T's, trying, of course, to sound as if it really weren't that big a deal, just another trade. There was in every office of Solomon a system-wide loudspeaker called the Hoot and Holler. Apart from money, success at Solomon meant having your name shouted over the Hoot and Holler. The AT and T trader's voice came loudly over the Hoot. Mike Lewis has just sold three million of our AT and T's for us. Thank you very much, Mike. I was flushed with pride, flushed with pride. You understand, but something didn't quite fit. What did he mean? Our AT and T's. 
I hadn't realized the AT&T bonds had been on Solomon's trading books. Dash was staring at me, disbelieving. I could see he was smiling. No, laughing. The trader's been sitting on that position for months. It's underwater. He's been dying to get rid of it. Don't tell him I told you this, but you're going to get fucked. The trader made me a promise, I protested. That's all right, Dash said. You're just a geek. Geeks were born to be fucked. He meant this in a nice way, to absolve me, as it were. What is the price of the AT&T bonds? A familiar voice was shouting at me the next morning. No longer was he cool and self-assured. Herman was beginning to sense that he was going to get fucked. They aren't doing real well, said the trader, when I asked him the price, but they'll come around. What's the price? I asked again. The trader pretended to shuffle through some complicated-looking sheets. This, I learned, was standard practice when a customer was about to be sacrificed for the greater good of Solomon. The trader tried to transfer the blame to some impersonal scientific force. It's the numbers, don't you see? I can't do anything for you. It was painfully apparent the AT&T trader was stalling. Something was very wrong. I could bid you ninety-five for them, he finally said. You can't do that, I said. You sold the things to me at ninety-seven yesterday, and the market hasn't moved. The treasuries are the same price. I can't go tell my customer he's out of pocket sixty thousand bucks. You lied to me, I started to shout. Look, he said, losing his patience. Who do you work for? This guy or Solomon Brothers? I had made the mistake of trusting a Solomon Brothers trader. He had drawn on the pooled ignorance of me and my first customer to unload one of his mistakes. He had saved himself and our firm sixty thousand dollars. But belly aching to the trader wasn't going to get me anywhere. He'd just dock my bonus at the end of the year. Belly aching would also make me look like a fool, as if I had actually thought the customer was going to make money on the AT and T's. How could anyone be so stupid as to trust a trader? The best thing I could do was pretend to others at Solomon that I had meant to screw the customer. People would respect that. That was called jamming. I had just jammed bonds, albeit unknowingly, for the first time. I had lost my innocence. But what did I tell Herman the German? Ah! He shouted as if he had been stabbed with a knife. He had lost all ability to articulate his feelings. What I didn't know, but soon learned, was that he had never imagined in his whole life losing sixty thousand dollars. His bank would have fired him if it knew he was down that much money. At the moment of impact, all he could do was make noises, the agony, the horror. And you want to know how I felt? I should have felt guilty, of course. But guilt was not the first identifiable sensation to emerge from my exploding brain. Relief was. He was shouting and moaning, and that was it. That was all he could do. That was the beauty of being a middleman, which I did not appreciate until that moment. The customer suffered. I didn't. I wasn't going to lose my job. On the contrary, I was a minor hero at Solomon for dumping a sixty thousand dollar loss into someone else's pocket. Till death did they part, my customer and his bonds. AT&T's bonds got cheaper and cheaper. Finally, about a month after the ordeal had begun, my customer's boss inquired into his activities. A loss of about a hundred and forty thousand dollars dutifully raised its hoary head, and my German was fired. Kaboom! But he got another job, and as far as I know, his children are well provided for. It was not an auspicious start to my career. Within a month, I'd blown up my first and only customer. There were, thankfully, plenty more where he came from. None of my activities in the first couple of months made so much as a dent on the bottom line of Solomon Brothers, but all were highly entertaining. What was more important than immediate results, I figured, was my education. I was niggled during those first few months by the feeling of being a charlatan. I kept blowing people up. I didn't know anything. Yet I was telling people what to do with millions of dollars when the largest financial complication I had ever encountered was a three hundred and twenty-five dollar overdraft in my account at the Chase Manhattan Bank. The only thing that saved me in meeting after meeting in the early days at Solomon was that the people I dealt with knew even less. London is, or was, a great refuge for hacks. It was only a matter of time before I would embarrass myself horribly. I scrambled to learn more. 
and managed to keep a half step ahead of humiliation. I was impressionable, but in educating myself, that proved to be a great strength. I had the ability to imitate. It enabled me to get inside the brain of another person. To learn how to make smart noises about money, I studied the two best Solomon salesmen I knew, Dash Riprock himself and a man on the 41st floor of Solomon, New York, whom I shall call, at his request, Alexander. My training amounted to absorbing and synthesizing their attitudes and skills. Luckily for me, they turned out to be two of the best bond men in the business. Dash and Alexander were as opposite as individuals as their respective choice of pseudonyms suggests, and their respective skills differed also. Dash did what most salesmen did, only better. He kept his nose pressed up against the green screens on which the market in U.S. government bonds was trading, and looked for small discrepancies in price. There are several hundred different U.S. government bonds, ranging in maturity from a few months to thirty years. Dash knew what their prices should be, which large investors own which bonds, and who is the weak hand in the market. If a price was off by an eighth of one percent, he'd pile half a dozen institutional investors into a trade to make that eighth of one percent. Tens of billions of dollars worth of U.S. government bonds pass through his phone in a year, en route from the U.S. government to Japan. Alexander was unique, the closest thing I met to a master of the markets, which I'm now convinced no man really is. He was 27, two years older than I, and had been with Solomon Brothers for two years when I arrived. He had grown up trading a portfolio of securities. He recalls making a killing in the stock market while in the seventh grade. At the age of 19, he lost $97,000 on U.S. Treasury bill futures. He was not, in other words, a normal child. Once he learned to ride his gains and cut his losses, he never looked back. What he lost in T-bills, he made back several times over in gold futures. Alexander knew how to exploit the world's financial markets. What's more, he had a knack for interpreting events around him. The most impressive aspect of this knack was its speed. When news broke, he seemed to have already planned his response. He trusted his nose completely. The luckiest thing that happened to me during the period I spent at Solomon Brothers was having Alexander take me into his confidence. When we met in London, he was returning to New York to be a bond salesman on the 41st floor. I was to replace him in London. There was no reason for him to watch over me. It was a genuinely selfless act, which I recount only because at the time it seemed so incredible. It was as if he had bought shares in my future and was determined to make the trade come right. We spoke on the phone at least three times each day, and as often as twenty. Many of the trades that Alexander suggested followed one of two patterns. First, when all investors were doing the same thing, he would actively seek to do the opposite. The word stockbrokers use for someone who uses this approach is contrarian. Everyone wants to be one, but no one is, for the sad reason that most investors are scared of looking foolish. But Alexander wasn't constrained by appearances, and he sought to exploit people who were. The second pattern to Alexander's thought was that in the event of a major dislocation, such as a stock market crash, a natural disaster, the breakdown of OPEC's production agreements, he would look away from the initial focus of investor interest and seek tertiary effects. Remember Chernobyl? When news broke that the Soviet nuclear reactor had exploded, Alexander called me. Only minutes before, confirmation of the disaster had blipped across our Quotron machines. Yet Alexander had already bought the equivalent of two super tankers of crude oil. The focus of investor attention was on the New York Stock Exchange, he said. In particular, it was on any company involved in nuclear power. The stocks of these companies were plummeting. Never mind that, he said. He had just purchased, on behalf of his clients, oil futures. Instantly in his mind, less supply of nuclear power equaled more demand for oil, and he was right. His investors made a large killing. Mine made a small killing. Minutes after I had persuaded a few clients to buy some oil, Alexander called back. Buy potatoes, he said. Got a hop. Then he hung up. Of course, a cloud of fallout would threaten European food and water supplies, including the potato crop, placing a premium on uncontaminated American substitutes. Each day, Alexander called and explained something new. After several months of struggling, I began to catch on. When Alexander hung up, 
I would call three or four investors and simply parrot what he had just said. They would think me, if not a genius, then at least astute. On the basis of what I told them, they put money on the line. They made handsome profits, just like the investors to whom Alexander spoke. Soon they were calling me. Before long, they wouldn't speak to anyone else but me. They would do whatever I, meaning Alexander, told them to do. This would soon prove very valuable. While Alexander taught me an attitude towards markets, Dash showed me style. By style, I mean phone technique. Much of our working time was spent on the telephone. Dash had a lot of phone technique. He placed his social calls to clients in a normal, upright, seated position. He placed his sales calls hunkered over, head under his desk. He used the space beneath his desk as a kind of soundproof booth. His taste for privacy had been acquired as a geek. When he didn't want the seasoned salespeople to overhear the stupid things he was telling his customers, now it was habit. I could tell when Dash was about to sell a few hundred million dollars of government bonds because his torso would jackknife in his chair so that his chest was almost in his lap, and his head went into the sound booth. Whenever he emerged from the tucked position without having sold bonds, I knew he had been talking to his mother. It wasn't cool to talk to your mother on the trading floor. I was only as conscious of miming Dash's movements on the phone and the trading floor as a child who acquires the mannerisms of a parent. I had no other point of reference. I too soon found myself jackknifed in my chair and generally looking much like Dash. Dash was Dash, Alexander was Alexander. I was a fraud, a composite of traits I felt rightfully belonged to these two. In my defense, I can say only that I was a very good fraud. Also, that I had one useful quality possessed by neither of my teachers: a detachment from the business and the firm. It comes, I suppose, from getting your job at a St. James's Palace fundraiser, or perhaps from having another source of income. I was a journalist at nights and on weekends while I was at Solomon Brothers. Anyway, such detachment is extremely helpful in a young career because it leaves you fearless. I had the same advantage of recklessness as a driver in a traffic jam with a rental car. The worst anyone could do to my rental career was take it away. The thought of losing my job didn't trouble me as much as it troubled lifers, such as say Dash Riprock. That is not to say I did not care. I cared immensely. I thrived on praise more than most, and thus sought to please. But I was willing to take greater risks than if I had felt deeply proprietary about my career. Guided by Alexander and Dash, I was equipped with sound money-making schemes, a persuasive sales voice, and the right trading floor look. Business followed quickly. Success bred success. Pretty soon, Solomon Management was leading me to the clients of other salespeople, in hopes that with larger customers, I could do gargantuan pieces of business. By June 1986, six months into the job. I was plugged into several of the largest pools of money in Europe. On the other end of my telephone, at my peak, when I left Solomon, my investors controlled collectively about fifty billion dollars. They were quick, aware, flexible, and rich. I had my own little full-service casino up and running, and it would, at its best, generate about ten million dollars a year in risk-free revenues for Solomon Brothers. I was, in short, doing pretty well. I stopped feeling like a geek the moment Solomon traders started asking my advice, and sometime in the middle of 1986, more by luck than by skill, I ceased to be a geek. I became a normal, established Solomon salesman. There was no one event that marked the change. I knew I was no longer a geek, only because people stopped calling me geek and started calling me Michael, which I preferred. There is a difference between this, though. And being called big swinging dick, a big swinging dick I was not. The journey from useless geek to Michael took about six months. The journey from Michael to big swinging dick happened almost immediately thereafter, and was occasioned by a single sale. There was a phenomenon known at Solomon as a priority. A priority was a huge number of bonds or stocks that had to be sold, either because selling them would make us rich, or because not selling them would make us poor. One of the biggest priorities during my stay at Solomon was eighty-six million dollars worth of bonds in the property company called Olympia and York. From mid-May to mid-August of 
the biggest swinging dicks in the Solomon Brothers system, did their best to sell these O and Y bonds and failed. Our failure was an embarrassment to everyone from President Tom Strauss to the lowest geek in London. One day, Alexander and I were speaking on the phone. He had tried to sell the O and Ys and failed, but he genuinely believed they had merit. O and Y bonds were an unusual priority because they were owned not by a trader, but by a single large Arab investor who was desperate to sell the Olympian Yorks and was not particularly knowledgeable about them, so would probably sell them cheaply. The stakes were high. The Arab investor had offered to buy another large block of bonds if and when we rid him of the Olympian Yorks. The combination of sales could net the firm as much as two million dollars. Now there was no one I trusted in quite the same way as I trusted Alexander, so I decided to share my secret with him. My secret was that I knew a man who'd buy the Olympia and Yorks. I had known how to sell the Olympia and York bonds for a month, but remembering my experience with AT and T's, kept the information to myself. The investor I had in mind, a Frenchman, wouldn't want to hold them for long. Only long enough for other investors to forget they'd ever turned them down. Then he'd sell them. Alexander helped me to persuade myself that if I went about selling the bonds in the right way, if I extracted promises from senior management that my customer would not get scalped, then everyone could win. If management would promise to make the Olympia and Yorks a sales priority again several months hence, and remove them from my customer's portfolio at a profit. And stick someone else's customer with them, then maybe we brave few would win. I spoke with the trader responsible for Olympia and York bonds. He said, of course, that he'd promised to keep my customer happy. Can you really sell them, though? He said, really, really. In his shifty eyes, there was a mixture of disbelief that the bonds could be sold, and greed at the thought of the profit he would make if they were. I didn't trust him. I changed my mind. But it was already too late. Traders hung around my desk instinctually, like dogs trying to get at a bitch in heat. Over the next twenty-four hours, I got calls from half a dozen salespeople. They all said the same thing as the traders: "Come on, please do it, and you'll be a hero." None of these people, however, was in a position to make me the assurance I felt I needed. Then the phone rang at my desk. I picked it up. The voice on the other end of the line was vaguely familiar. It said, "Hey, slugger, how the fuck are you? Do you think you got a fucking chance with these fucking bonds?" It was the Grand Master of Fuck Speak, the Human Piranha. It was the first time we had spoken, and it turned out that responsibility for getting rid of the Olympia and York bonds fell ultimately to him. He promised that he would make sure my customer didn't get hurt. And as meaningless as that would sound coming from others, from him it mattered. He was, as much as was possible in a world where the buck was almighty, a man of his word. I called Alexander and told him that I was about to sell the bonds. He quickly placed bets with managing directors on the forty-first floor that I would sell the bonds. He got odds of ten to one. This was insider trading at its most respectable. I then called my Frenchman and told him how a panicked Arab. Dubbed the camel jockey by the human piranha, wanted to dump eighty-six million dollars worth of bonds cheaply. How the bonds were out of fashion and undervalued compared with other similar bonds in the marketplace, and how if he bought them and held them for a few months, a buyer in America might emerge. I considered him my best customer, and he trusted me. I think, even though we had known each other for only four months, and here I was, selling him something I probably wouldn't touch with a large pole. If there hadn't been such glory in it for me, I knew it was awful, but I feel much worse about it now than I did at the time. After thinking it over for maybe a minute, he bought the Olympia and Yorks. For two days, messages of congratulations arrived from distant points in the Solomon Brothers system. Most of the bigwigs in the firm called to say how happy they were and how bright my future was at Solomon Brothers. Strauss, Ranieri. Merriweather and Vute each called separately, right on top of each other. I was being blessed by the gods. As a rule, the greater the praise lavished upon a salesman within Solomon, the greater the eventual suffering of the customer. 
My customer eventually escaped with a small profit, but he never forgave me for the hell I put him through. Finally, the most important call of all came. It was from the human piranha. I heard you sold a few bonds, he said. I tried to sound calm about the whole thing. He didn't. He shouted into the phone, That is fucking awesome. I fucking mean fucking awesome. You are one big swinging dick. It brought tears to my eyes to hear it, to be called a big swinging dick by the man who, in my mind, had the greatest right to confer it upon me. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs at the bellhop in my room at the Bristol Hotel in Paris. What do you mean there is no bathrobe in my suite? He's backing towards the door, shrugging his shoulders, as if he can't do anything about it, the little shit. God damn it, I shouted. Get me the manager. Then I wake up. Investment banking nightmares have haunted me ever since I sold the Olympia and York bonds. Spoil rotten by a combination of too much luxury and the awesome stature of big swinging dictum. Imagine, no bathrobe. Anyway, it's over, and it's 6 a.m., time for work. This day in August 1986 will turn out to be special. I'm about to have my first encounter with the sort of backstabbing and intrigue for which investment bankers are justifiably renowned. At 10 a.m. that day in London, Alexander telephoned. He wanted to know why the dollar was plunging. I told Alexander that several Arabs had sold massive holdings of gold, for which they received dollars. They were selling those dollars for Deutschmarks, and thereby driving the dollar lower. I spent much of my working life inventing logical lies like this. Most of the time when markets move, no one has any idea why. A man who can tell a good story can make a good living as a broker. It was the job of people like me to make up reasons, to spin a plausible yarn. And it's amazing what people will believe. Heavy selling out of the Middle East was an old standby. Alexander, of course, had a keen sense of the value of my commentary. He just laughed. There was a more pressing matter to discuss. One of my customers was certain that the German bond market was due for a rise. He wanted to make a big bet on it. Up to that point, my customer had simply bought hundreds of millions of Deutschmarks worth of German government bonds. I wondered if there wasn't a more daring play to be made in the market. This is a typical thought for a person who has become overly accustomed to betting other people's money. Alexander and I sorted out my jumbled thoughts. And in the process, we stumbled across a great idea, an entirely new security. My client loved risk. Risk, I had learned, was a commodity in itself. Risk could be canned and sold like tomatoes. Different investors place different prices on risk. If you are able, as it were, to buy risk from one investor cheaply and sell it to another investor dearly, you can make money without taking any risk yourself. And this is what we did. My client wanted to take a big risk by wagering a large sum of money on German bonds rising. He was therefore a buyer of risk. Alexander and I created a security, called a warrant or a call option, which was a means of transferring risk from one party to another. In buying our warrant, risk-averse investors from around the world, meaning most investors, would be, in effect, selling us risk. Many of these investors would not know they wanted to sell risk on the German bond market until we suggested it to them with our new warrant. Just as most people didn't know they wanted to plug their ears all day and listen to Pink Floyd until Sony produced the Walkman. The difference between what we paid cautious investors for the risk and what we sold it to my customer for would be our profits. We estimated this would come to about $700,000. The idea was a dream. Solomon Brothers, which sat in the middle of this transfer of risk, would take no risk whatsoever. But even more important, as far as Solomon was concerned, was the novelty of our deal. A warrant on German interest rates was new. The publicity of being the first investment bank ever to issue them was the sort of thing that drives investment bankers mad with desire. As we hashed out the deal, people on the trading floor began to grow curious. A vice president from another area of the trading floor started to sniff around. I'll call this man the opportunist. 
he decided that it was his mission to play a part in our deal. I voiced no objection. He had worked at Solomon for six years, twice as long as Alexander and I combined, and we could use his experience. The opportunist, for his part, had nothing else to do. Bonus time was fast approaching. He desperately wanted to distinguish himself and saw our deal as his chance. To be fair, the opportunist was not entirely without purpose. He became our emissary to the German finance ministry. He persuaded the authorities that our deal would neither undermine their ability to control their money supply, which was true, nor encourage speculation in German interest rates, which was false. The whole point was to facilitate speculation. He won the confidence of senior officials at the ministry, right up, I believe, to the minister of finance himself. When the deal finally went through, it was a smashing success. Solomon Brothers and my customer made out like bandits. It was clear that Alexander and I were in for a bit of local fame. The opportunist, too, deserved applause. Then the trouble began. The afternoon on which the deal was launched, a memo was circulated in London and New York, describing how the deal had been done. In the memo, no mention was made of Alexander, my client, or myself. The memo was signed, the opportunist. It was so clearly unjust, so wildly deceitful, that I should have laughed. At the time, however, it didn't seem funny. I headed towards his desk to do him violence. The opportunist, it turned out, was one step ahead of me. He had raced to catch the first Concorde to New York the moment his memo hit the Xerox machine. The opportunist was doing what Alexander aptly described as a victory lap around the 41st floor in New York. On his jog around 41, he stopped and told people like good friend how well the deal had gone. We had a choice, Alexander and I. We could either get mad or get even. Alexander listened to my tirade and decided, instead, to be an adult and ignore the whole thing. I decided to get even. I was in the jungle now and developing a taste for guerrilla warfare. My degree in art history finally served my career. I knew all about frauds. Ask yourself, what would a painter do if a rival stole his work and put his name on it? He'd paint a replica and issue a challenge for the rival to do the same. The opportunist had represented himself as the sole source of warrant wisdom, and if that could be disproved, he would, to an extent, be discredited. We, for I enjoyed Alexander's mischievous support, if not his approval, conceived another deal, similar enough to the first as to be unmistakably from the same hand. It involved government bonds of Japan, not Germany, and had a slightly different underlying structure. Before the deal came off, I did my own lap of the 41st floor of New York. Call it a warm-up lap. A warm-up lap, unlike a victory lap, could be done by telephone. I made several calls. The opportunist, though he liked to claim that he reported directly to John Goodfriend, had a boss. His boss was still basking in the reflected glory of his minion. Suddenly the boss found himself in an awkward situation. Several men of his rank ribbed him about the new Japanese deal, saying in effect, it seems that the brains of this operation may have been somewhere other than in the head of your employee. The opportunist's boss called the opportunist to ask why he hadn't been informed of this new deal. The opportunist did not know about the deal either nor did he convincingly demonstrate that he understood it. My phone bombs had found their target. I was willing to stop being a pig and leave the matter at that. He wasn't. When the opportunist returned to London, he was standing over me, glaring. Come into Charlie's office, said the opportunist, at precisely eight o'clock. Charlie was our chairman. One of the opportunist's more charming habits was that Though he was but a mere dime a dozen vice president, he used the office of our chairman as if it were his own. As expected, he took the seat behind the desk. I took the chair on the other side and felt like a schoolboy about to be scolded. He was the thief, I reminded myself. Perhaps I give Solomon Brothers too much credit and myself too little, 
but I think that what crossed my mind next would never have done so before I set foot on the trading floor. In short, I decided to do him in. The joy of having the upper hand swept over me. Instead of being uneasy or anxious or angry, I suddenly relished the thought of calculated confrontation. It was clear how to do maximum damage, to say as little as possible, and give him the chance to say something he shouldn't. The opportunist had had a chance to calm down. He had one foot up on the desk and was looking down at an object jiggling in his hand. A pen, I think. He wouldn't look me in the eye. What do you think you're doing, he asked. You can't do a deal without my help. I can stop your deal from happening with a single phone call. He then listed several billion dollars worth of deals in the past that were or weren't done by Solomon Brothers because of him. Why on earth would you interfere with my deal if it is going to be a profitable piece of business? I asked. I knew precisely why he would interfere with a profitable piece of business. If he wasn't going to get the credit, he didn't want to see it happen. He knew I was aware. That made him angry. And getting angry was his big mistake. I can get you fired, he said, with a single phone call. There was drama in his phone calls. All I've got to do is call a good friend, and you are out of here. That was it. I had just drawn a fourth ace. The opportunist was bluffing, and it was written all over his face. He couldn't get me fired, not even close. What is more, a lot of people would be angry when they learned of his threat. He had stepped. Albeit in a way I didn't expect, into trouble. There was no point in continuing. I feigned concern. I told him that I was sorry, that I would never do it again, and that whenever I had a good idea in the future, I would be sure to run straight away and give it to him. Somehow he believed me. What the opportunist had neglected to consider in his scheme was the omniscient, omnipotent, omnivorous presence. No, not God. A person on the trading floor, known as a syndicate manager. Syndicate managers are charged with the job of coordinating all deals. The London syndicate manager of Solomon, one of the few powerful women within the firm, had coordinated a German warrant. Syndicate managers are the investment banking equivalents of chiefs of staff in the White House. They see all, they hear all, they know all. You don't cross a syndicate manager. If you do, you get hurt. The next day, I told the London syndicate manager of my conversation the previous night. She knew the truth of the German warrant deal because she had played a role in its success. She was even angrier than I had hoped. She was also extremely plugged in at Solomon Brothers, in a way that the opportunist was not. I mercilessly left his fate in her hands. It was like leaving a goldfish in the care of an alley cat. Only then, after it was too late to reverse the process, did I feel remorse, but not much. I didn't learn until much later the end of the story. The syndicate manager I spoke with was directly responsible for deciding what the opportunist was paid. The opportunist was expecting a lot of money, and a promotion from vice president to director. The promotion was critical to his future. This woman made five or six phone calls and squashed his plans. I had to wait until bonus time, the end of December, to see the effect. Promotions were announced a week before the money was passed out. The opportunist remained a vice president. Once his bonus had landed in his bank account, he quit the firm. At this point in the story, in the fall of 1986, my fortunes and the fortunes of my firm diverge. The money poured in through my telephone. But it didn't seem to register on the bottom line of Solomon Brothers. The bull market in bonds finally lost its head of steam. In November, the market plunged briefly, and financial Darwinism prevailed. Many weak Solomon traders, along with a few customers, blew themselves up. At the end of the year, bonuses would be paid. For the first time in many, many years at Solomon Brothers, Christmas looked to be a time of sadness. Thoughts around Solomon Brothers turned away from the greater glory of the firm and focused on self-preservation. Who was fucking up? Was the question most often asked. The salesmen blame the traders, and the traders blame the salesmen. Why couldn't we sell their bonds to stupid European investors? The traders wanted to know. 
Why couldn't they find bonds that weren't so embarrassingly awful? The salesman wanted to know. The plain fact was that a combination of market forces and gross mismanagement had thrown Solomon Brothers into deep trouble. At times, it was as if we had no management at all. No one put a stop to the infighting. No one gave us a sense of direction. No one put a halt to our rapid growth. No one wanted to make the hard decisions that businessmen, like generals, simply have to make. Quick, just give me my money while there's still some left. That was the general sentiment in the air at the end of 1986. The money was handed out on December 21st. Until that time, people thought and spoke of nothing but bonuses. Bonus day. When it arrived, was an enthralling reprieve from my daily routine of chatting with investors and placing bets in the markets. Watching the faces of other people as they emerged from their compensation meetings was worth a thousand lectures on the meaning of money in our small society. People responded in one of three ways when they heard how much richer they were: with relief, with joy, and with anger. Most felt some blend of the three. A few felt all three distinctly: relief when told, joy when it occurred to them what to buy, and anger when they heard that others of their level had been paid more. But the look on their faces was always the same, no matter what the sizes of their bonuses. They looked sick to their stomachs. It was as if they had eaten too much chocolate pie. Being paid was sheer misery for many. On January first, nineteen eighty-seven. 1986 would be erased from memory, except for a single number: the amount of money you were paid. That number was the final summing up. My own compensation meeting was late in the day. I met with my jungle guide, Stu Willeker, and the sales manager of the London office. My jungle guide simply listened and smiled. The sales manager shuffled some papers in front of him, then began. I have seen a lot of people come through here and shoot the lights out in their first year," he said. "But I have never seen anyone have the kind of year that you have had." He began to list names again. "Not Bill, not Rich, not Joe," he said. "Not even," and he named the human piranha. "Not even the human piranha." "What can I say?" he said. "But congratulations." He spoke for about five minutes and achieved the desired effect. When he finished. I was prepared to pay him for the privilege of working at Solomon Brothers, and I thought I knew how to sell. Most of the cynicism and bitterness I was developing for the organization melted. I felt deeply reverent about the firm, my numerous bosses, John Goodfriend, the AT&T trader, and everybody who had ever had anything to do with Solomon Brothers, except perhaps the opportunist. I didn't care about money. I just wanted this man to approve of my performance. I began to understand why they gave you a talk before they give you the money. Like priests, paymasters in the Solomon Empire followed a time-honored pattern. The money always came as an afterthought, and in a knot you had to disentangle. Last year you made ninety thousand dollars, he said. Forty-five was salary, so forty-five was bonus. Next year your salary will be sixty thousand dollars. Now let me explain those numbers. While he was explaining that I was paid more than anyone else in my training class, I later learned that three others were paid as much. I was thinking, "Ha, I'm rich. I love my employer. My employer loves me. I'm happy." Then the meeting ended, and I thought again. When I had a moment to reflect, I decided I wasn't so pleased. Weird, huh? This was Solomon Brothers. Remember, these were the same people who had me blowing up customers with exploding AT&T bonds. I had done their dirty work for a year, and had only a few thousand dollars to show for it. Money out of my pocket was money in the pocket of the man who had sung my praises. Words were cheap. I decided, in the end, I had been taken for a ride. A view I still think is strictly correct. I wasn't sure how many millions of dollars I had made for Solomon Brothers, but by any fair measure, I deserved much more than ninety thousand dollars. You don't get rich in this business," said Alexander, when I complained privately to him. "You only attain new levels of relative poverty. You think Goodfriend feels rich? 
of that knot. There developed a pattern to my existence. Each month began with an analysis of my small unit's performance, each week with an office meeting, and each day with a series of phone calls to whomever I thought might like to roll the dice. On one day late in my second year, September 24, 1987, the pattern was unexpectedly broken. Someone shouted, We're in play! I checked my news screens. News was flashing across that Ronald O. Perlman, the five-foot-four-inch husband of a New York gossip columnist, the notorious hostile raider who had lately conquered the cosmetic firm Revlon, was making a bid to buy a large chunk of Solomon Brothers. His financial backer was Drexel Burnham, and his advisors were Joseph Perella and Bruce Wasserstein from First Boston. It was the first time Wall Street had turned and attacked its own. Why was a lipstick merchant coming after us? The most intriguing answer was that it wasn't his idea. Perlman's bid could easily be seen as a hate bomb lobbed at John Goodfriend by Drexel's junk bond king and Perlman's true backer, Michael Milken. Milken often lobbed hate bombs at people who treated him badly, and Goodfriend had treated him badly. In early 1985, Milken had visited our offices for a breakfast meeting with Goodfriend. It started with Milken growing angry because Goodfriend refused to speak to him as an equal. It ended in a shouting match, with Milken being escorted from the building by a security guard. Good friend subsequently cut Drexel out of all Solomon Brothers bond deals. Then Drexel found itself at the center of the largest SEC investigation ever. Rather than send flowers, a Solomon Brothers managing director mailed to Milken's clients copies of legal complaints for extortion and racketeering filed against Milken by three other clients. The relationship between Solomon Brothers and Drexel Burnham was, in September 1987, rightly regarded as the worst between any two firms on Wall Street. Milken spooked Goodfriend. For all of his worldly ambition, Goodfriend remained remarkably parochial and introverted. Milken, on the other hand, had built the biggest new business on Wall Street, the junk bond, and his goal was nothing less than to usurp Solomon's position in the bond markets. Whatever Goodfriend said remarked one of my colleagues much nearer to good friend than I. He always thought just one firm was capable of deballing Solomon Brothers, of taking over our franchise. Drexel. Our employees defected to Drexel at an alarming rate. At least a dozen former Solomon Brothers traders and salespeople staffed Milken's 85-man Beverly Hills junk bond trading floor, and many more worked for Drexel in New York. The defections to Drexel were, not surprisingly, self-perpetuating. Reports of the magical sums of money to be made working for Michael Milken trickled back into Solomon and made us drool. A former Solomonite told of his first bonus with Michael Milken. Milken handed him several million dollars more than he expected. He was staring at a bonus that was bigger than John Goodfriend's entire compensation package. He sat in his chair, stunned, like a character from the old television show The Millionaire. Milken watched him, then asked, Are you happy? The former Solomon employee nodded. Milken leaned forward in his chair and asked, How can we make you happier? Milken drowned his people in money. The magnificent stories had many of us at Solomon hoping for a phone call from Milken. Whenever a newspaper printed an estimate of Milken's paycheck, apparently, the entire Beverly Hills office of Drexel had a chuckle at how low it was. Still, you had to wonder what gave Michael Milken greater pleasure, making a billion dollars or watching good friend squirm as one of his biggest clients, Ronald Perlman, stalked Solomon Brothers. Another way to see Perlman's bid was his retribution for the sins of our management. Dash and I decided that a takeover of our firm was not such a bad idea, not that anyone sought our views. We knew that Ronald Perlman, lipstick mogul, swashbuckler, and rogue, had no clue how to run an investment bank. But we also knew that if he succeeded in conquering Goodfriend, the first thing he would do would be to examine the firm as a business instead of as an empire, which would be a new and refreshing approach to running Solomon Brothers. Our most severe misjudgments were not steps we had taken, but steps we had neglected to take. It wasn't as though investment banking in 1987 was no longer a profitable business. On the contrary, 
it was more profitable than ever before. Open any newspaper, and you saw investment bankers raking in fees of fifty million dollars and more from a few weeks of work. For the first time in many years, other firms, not Solomon, were making the money. Ironically, the new winners were just those men helping Ronald Perlman in his bid to buy us: Milken, Wasserstein, and Perella. Drexel Burnham, thanks to Michael Milken, had replaced us as Wall Street's most profitable investment bank in 1986. It had cleared 545.5 million dollars on revenues of four billion dollars, more than we had made at our best. Drexel was making its fortune in junk bonds, and that stung. We were supposed to be Wall Street's bond traders. We were in danger of losing that distinction, however, for our managers had failed to see how important junk bonds would become. They thought junk was a passing fad. That was easily their single most expensive oversight, for it precipitated not only a revolution in corporate America, and a giddy free-for-all on Wall Street, but the takeover attempt of Solomon Brothers. Junk bonds are bonds issued by corporations, deemed by the two chief credit rating agencies, Moody's and Standard and Poor's, to be unlikely to repay their debts. Junk bonds are easily the most controversial financial tool of the 1980s. They have been much in the news, but they are not, it should be emphasized, new. Companies, like people, have always borrowed money to buy things they haven't had the cash to afford. What is new is the size of the junk bond market, the array of rickety companies deeply in hock, and the number of investors willing to risk their principal, and perhaps also their principals, by lending to these companies. Michael Milken at Drexel created that market by persuading investors that junk bonds were a smart bet, in much the same fashion that Louis Ranieri persuaded investors that mortgage bonds were a smart bet. In her book *The Predator's Ball*, Connie Brook traced the rise of Drexel's junk bond department. Milken reportedly tried to pay the author not to publish. The story she tells begins in 1970, when Michael Milken studied bonds at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Finance. He was blessed with an unconventional mind. At Wharton, he examined fallen angels, the bonds of one-time blue-chip corporations now in trouble. At the time, fallen angels were the only junk bonds around. Milken noticed that they were cheap compared with the bonds of blue-chip corporations, even considering the additional risk they carried. The owner of a portfolio of fallen angels, by Milken's analysis. Almost always outperformed the owner of a portfolio of blue chip bonds. There was a reason: investors shunned fallen angels out of a fear of seeming imprudent. It is a remarkably simple observation. Milken began his career that same year, 1970, in Drexel's back office. He pushed his way onto the trading floor and became a bond trader. The parallels between Milken and Ranieri are striking. Like Ranieri. Milken lacked both tact and couth, but not confidence. He was perfectly happy to stand apart from his colleagues. Milken sat in a corner of the trading floor while he created his market, ostracized until he made too much money to be anything but the boss. Also like Ranieri, he built a team of devoted employees. Milken is Jewish, and Drexel, when he joined them, was an old line WASP investment bank with, he felt, an anti-Semitic streak. Milken considered himself an outsider. That was a point in his favor. In 1979, a good guess at who would revolutionize finance in the coming decade would have been made as follows: search the unfashionable corner of Wall Street, eliminate everyone who appears to have just emerged from a Brooks Brothers catalog, everyone who belongs or claims to belong to exclusive clubs, and everyone who comes from a good WASP family. Among the leftovers would have been not only Milken and Ranieri, but Joseph Perella and Bruce Wasserstein of First Boston. Here, the similarity with Ranieri ends. For unlike Ranieri, Michael Milken took complete control of his firm. He moved his junk bond operation from New York to Beverly Hills, and eventually paid himself five hundred and fifty million dollars a year, one hundred and eighty times what Ranieri made at his peak. When Milken opened his Wilshire Boulevard office, which he owns, he let it be known who was in charge by putting his name on the door instead of Drexel's, and he created a working environment that was different from Solomon Brothers in one crucial respect: success was measured strictly by how many deals you brought in, 
rather than by how many people work for you, whether you had a seat on the board of directors, and how many gossip columns you appeared in. Milken often spoke to students at business schools. On these occasions, he liked, for dramatic effect, to demonstrate how hard it actually is to put a large company into bankruptcy. The forces interested in keeping a large company afloat, he argued, are far greater than those that wish to see it perish. He present the students with the following hypothetical situation. First, he'd say, "Let's locate our major factory in an earthquake zone. Then let's infuriate our unions by paying the executives large sums of money while cutting wages." Third, let's select a company on the brink of bankruptcy to supply us with an essential, irreplaceable component in our production line. And fourth, just in case our government is tempted to bail us out when we get into trouble, let's bribe a few indiscreet foreign officials. That, Milken would conclude, is precisely what Lockheed had done in the late 1970s. Milken had purchased Lockheed bonds when the company looked to be heading for liquidation. And had made a small fortune when it was saved, in spite of itself. What Milken was saying was that the entire American credit rating system was flawed. It focused on the past when it should have focused on the future, and it was burdened by a phony sense of prudence. Milken plugged the hole in the system. He ignored large Fortune 100 companies in favor of ones with no credit standing. To compensate the lender for the higher risk, the junk bonds of these companies bear a higher rate of interest. Sometimes four or five or six percent higher than the bonds of blue chip companies. They also tend to pay the lender a big fat fee if the borrower makes enough money to repay his loans prematurely. So when the company makes money, its junk soars in anticipation of the windfall, and when the company loses money, its junk sinks in anticipation of default. In short, junk bonds behave much more like equity or shares. Than old-fashioned corporate bonds. Therein lies one of the surprisingly well-kept secrets of Milken's market. Drexel's research department, because of its close relationship with companies, was privy to raw inside corporate data that somehow never found its way to Solomon Brothers. When Milken traded junk bonds, he had inside information. Now it is quite illegal to trade in stocks on inside information, as former Drexel client Ivan Boski has ably demonstrated. But there is no such law regarding bonds. Who, when the law was written, ever imagined that one day there would be so many bonds that behave like stock? Not surprisingly, the line between debt and equity, so sharply drawn in the mind of a Solomon bond trader, becomes blurred in the mind of a Drexel bond trader. Debt ownership in a shaky enterprise means control, for when a company fails to meet its interest payments, a bondholder can foreclose and liquidate the company. Michael Milken, Dash Riprock said, has turned the business inside out. He screws the corporate borrower on behalf of investors. Borrowers were squeezed because they had nowhere else to go but to Milken for money. What Milken offered was access to lenders. The lenders, along with Milken, made money. The gist of Milken's pitch to them was this: build a huge portfolio of junk bonds, and it does not matter if a few turn out to be lemons. The higher payoff on the winner should more than offset the losses on the losers. Drexel was prepared to gamble on companies, said Milken to institutional investors. Join us, invest in the future of America, the small growth companies that make us great. It was a populist message. The early junk bond investors, like mortgage investors, could make money and feel good about themselves. Meanwhile, the new market was exploding. Between 1980 and 1987. According to IDD Information Services, 53 billion dollars worth of junk bonds came to market. That is only a fraction of the market, however, because it neglects the billions of dollars worth of new man-made fallen angels. Milken devised a way to transform the bonds of the most stable companies to junk, leveraged corporate takeovers. Having attracted tens of billions of dollars to his new speculative market, Milken by 1985. Was faced with more money than places to put it. It must have been awkward for him. He simply could not find enough worthy small growth companies and old fallen angels to absorb the cash. He needed to create junk bonds to satisfy the demand for them. His original premise, that junk bonds are cheap because lenders are too chicken to buy them, 
was shot to hell. Demand now exceeded natural supply. Milken and his Drexel colleagues fell upon the solution. They'd used junk bonds to finance raids on undervalued corporations by simply pledging the assets of the corporations as collateral to the junk bond buyers. A takeover of a large corporation could generate billions of dollars worth of junk bonds, for not only would new junk be issued, but the increased leverage transformed the outstanding bonds of a former blue-chip corporation to junk. To raid corporations, however, Milken needed a few hitmen. The new and exciting job of invading corporate boardrooms appealed mainly to men of modest experience in business and a great deal of interest in becoming rich. Milken funded the dreams of every corporate raider of note. Ronald Perlman, Boone Pickens, Carl Icahn, Erwin Jacobs, Sir James Goldsmith, Nelson Peltz, Samuel Heyman, Saul Steinberg, and Asher Edelman. Most sold junk bonds through Drexel to raise money to storm such hitherto unassailable fortresses as Revlon, Phillips Petroleum, Unical, TWA, Disney, AFC, Crown Zellerback, National Can, and Union Carbide. To the men in Wall Street's small mergers and acquisitions departments, Michael Milken was a godsend, a vindication of their choice of careers. Perella, Wasserstein, and countless others apart from Drexel relished the turn of events. Each takeover required a minimum of two advisors, one for the raider and another for his prey. So Drexel couldn't keep all the business it created for itself. Most deals involved four or more investment bankers, as several buyers competed for the prize. There was, in other words, plenty of work to go around. Mergers and acquisitions departments mushroomed across Wall Street in the mid-1980s, just as bond trading departments had mushroomed a few years before. There was a deep financial connection between the two. Both drew heavily on the willingness of investors to speculate in bonds. Both also drew on the willingness of people to borrow more than they could easily repay. Both, in short, depended on a whole new attitude toward debt. Every company has got people sitting around who do nothing for what they get paid, says Joe Perella. If they take on a lot of debt, it forces them to cut fat. The takeover specialist did for debt what Ivan Bosky did for greed. Debt is good, they said. Debt works. And the process by which a takeover occurs is frighteningly simple, in view of its effects on community, workers, shareholders, and management. A paper manufacturer in Oregon appears cheap to the 26-year-old playing with his computer late one night in New York or London. He writes his calculations on a telex, which he sends to any party remotely interested in paper, in Oregon, or in buying cheap companies. Like the organizer of a debutante party, the 26-year-old keeps a file on his desk of who is keen on whom, but he isn't particularly discriminating in issuing invitations. Anyone can buy because anyone can borrow using junk bonds. The papermaker in Oregon is now a target. The next day, the papermaker reads about himself in the Herd on the Street column of the Wall Street Journal. His stock price is convulsing like a hanged man, because arbitrageurs, like Ivan Bosky, have begun to buy his company's shares in hopes of making a quick buck by selling out to the raider. The papermaker panics and hires an investment banker to defend him, perhaps even the same 26-year-old responsible for his misery. Five other 26-year-olds at five hitherto uninvolved investment banks read the rumors and begin to scour the landscape for a buyer of the paper company. Once a buyer is found, the company is officially in play. The money to be made from defending and attacking large companies makes bond trading look like a pauper's game. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Shearson Lehman, and others wasted no time in establishing themselves. Solomon Brothers missed the bonanza. There was no reason for this other than a certain unwillingness to emerge from our bond trading shell. We were well positioned to enter the business. With our access to the nation's lenders, we should have been a leader in the financing of takeovers. Of course, we had an excuse for missing such a huge opportunity. Our excuse was that junk bonds were evil. Henry Kaufman, Solomon's economic guru, made speech after speech arguing that corporate America was over-borrowing and that junk bond mania would end in ruin. He may have been right, 
but that's not why we didn't leap into junk bonds. We didn't underwrite junk bonds because our senior management didn't understand them. And in the midst of the civil war on the 41st floor, no one had the time or the energy to learn. In any case, whether Solomon Brothers participated or Solomon Brothers abstained, every company was by now a potential target for Milken's raiders, including Solomon Brothers. That was the final irony of Ronald Perlman's bid. We were being raided by a man financing himself with junk bonds because we had neglected to enter the business of raiding companies and financing the raids with junk bonds. Soon after the news broke of Perlman's ambitions, Goodfriend made a speech to the firm saying he didn't approve of hostile raiders and that he intended to shun Perlman. But apart from that, which we could have guessed on our own, we were left, as usual, uninformed. We relied on the staff writers of the Wall Street Journal to learn the blow-by-blow of the event. The story was this. The tears had first flowed on Saturday morning, September 19th, a few days before the news broke. On that morning, John Goodfriend received a telephone call at his apartment from his friend and lawyer, Martin Lipton. Lipton knew that Solomon's largest shareholder, Minorco, had found a mystery buyer for its 14% stake. Goodfriend had known for months that Minorco wanted to sell its holdings, but he had been slow to accommodate their wishes. This was bad judgment. As a result, he lost control of the process. On Wednesday, September 23rd, Goodfriend learned from the president of Minorco the bad news that the buyer was Revlon. It was clearly the beginning of a takeover attempt. Revlon's Perlman said that in addition to Minorco's shares, he wanted to buy another 11% stake in Solomon, which would bring his stake to 25%. If Perlman succeeded, Goodfriend, for the first time, would lose his grip on the firm. Goodfriend scrambled to find an alternative to Revlon for Minorco. He called his friend Warren Buffett, the shrewd money manager. Buffett, of course, expected to be paid to rescue Goodfriend, and Goodfriend arranged a surprisingly sweet deal. Instead of Buffett's purchasing our shares outright, Goodfriend proposed only that Buffett lend us money. We, Solomon, would buy in our own shares. We needed $809 million. Buffett said he'd lend us $700 million of that by purchasing what was in effect a Solomon Brothers bond, known as a convertible preferred security. It bore an interest rate of 9%, which was, in itself, a good return on his investment. The arrangement had two consequences. It preserved good friend's job, and it cost us, or rather, our shareholders, a great deal of money. Our shareholders, after all, would pay for Buffett's gift. After Buffett made his investment and good friend kept his job, life in our firm almost returned to normal for a few weeks. But a fundamental question about Solomon Brothers had been raised. We all knew our firm was badly managed. But was it so badly managed that even a buccaneer like Perlman could hope to improve its condition? Actually, another question was more likely on the minds of the big swinging dicks of the 41st floor. People who for so long had viewed money as the measure of success were bound to envy not only Perlman, but Wasserstein, Perella, and Milken. Especially Michael Milken. The question of the day on 41 was, how come he makes a billion dollars and I don't? This question drives us right to the center of what has happened in financial America over the past few years. For Milken, not Solomon Brothers, had made the biggest trade of the era. That trade was, of course, the buying and selling of corporate America. Solomon had missed the grand shift in its own business from trading bonds to trading entire industries. In the middle of October 1987, Solomon Brothers, still retching from its brief encounter with Perlman, underwent the most concentrated trauma in its history. Monday, October 12, 1987, Day 1. An unnamed board member of Solomon Brothers, Deep Throat, sometime during the weekend, told a New York Times reporter that the firm was planning to fire a thousand people. The news was completely unexpected. We all knew Solomon Brothers had been conducting a review of its business, but we had been assured that absolutely, under no circumstances, would the review put anyone's job at risk. 
This morning, the head of the London office called us together in our auditorium and said that no decisions had been made regarding personnel, implying that no one was to be fired. In that case, someone in New York made some pretty quick decisions, because later in the day, two entire departments on the 41st floor, municipal bonds and money markets, consisting of around 500 people, were summarily dismissed. Neither municipal bonds nor money markets were profitable. Does that mean we should have dropped them completely? The firm could, at little expense, have kept a small staff in both markets. That would have appeased the customers who had come to depend on us in these areas and were now furious with us. And it would have enabled us to profit in the event that either of the two markets recovered. What jarred the intellect even more than the treatment of fully formed businesses as trading fodder was the excuse Goodfriend gave for the bailout. He told the firm and the press that he had intended to prune intelligently, but had been forced by events outside his control to take quick action. Once the news hit the papers, he said, he had to get out immediately. The New York Times, in other words, affected policy at Solomon Brothers. Either that, or the chairman was using the New York Times as an excuse for what he had done. What was perhaps most disturbing of all, however, was that the only promise made to all new Solomon Brothers employees had been broken. Most people had been assigned to municipal bonds and money markets without having had much say in the matter. I'm glad I hadn't believed Jim Massey when he told us, as he told every training class, to relax and let the firm decide which department you joined. Performance will always be rewarded, he had said. Many had trusted him. If the firm broke the covenant when it fired Louis Ranieri, it scattered the shards with this decision. At the end of the grisly day, there were as many nervous people as there had been at the beginning, especially in London. Deep Throat had told the New York Times that Solomon planned to fire a thousand people. Five hundred were gone. It clearly wasn't over yet. But who, pray tell, was next? Wednesday, October 14th, 1987. Day 3. President Tom Strauss came to London to tell us that we had been earmarked as the branch office most in need of cuts. You couldn't fault them. We weren't doing very well. The waiting part was the worst. People on the London trading floor seemed to have no clue whether they had been targeted by management or not. But we all knew that a lot of us, as many as a third of the bond people, would be liquidated. Each person considered himself essential to the future of Solomon Brothers. I, too, considered myself essential to its future. I began to wonder, what will I do if they fire me? Then... What will I do if they don't fire me? All of a sudden, Solomon Brothers seemed more leavable than before. Friday, October 16th, 1987. Day 5. It was a bad day for 170 people in our office. Most of us hovered near our desks. Phone calls came from managing directors, inviting people one by one to their doom. What was so awful was not the loss of income, but the embarrassment of having failed. Management took the path of least resistance and fired the most recent additions to the office until the day came to resemble the massacre of the innocents. This defeated the purpose of the cuts. Fire ten geeks and you reduce costs by about as much as if you had fired one elderly, that is, mid-thirties, managing director. I was safe, partly because I was considered unbelievably an old hand, partly because I had just enough friends in high places, and partly because I was one of the two or three biggest producers in the office. A disproportionately large number of women in London were fired. They later compared notes and learned they had been given, almost verbatim, the same speech by the head of sales. To each he hemmed and hawed and said, You're a smart gal. This is no reflection on your abilities. Most of them didn't like being called gal. Who are you calling gal, Peckerwood? A few told the security guard to fuck off when he asked for their passes, and fuck off he did. As the firings progressed, the victims began to return to the trading floor. There was a good deal of weeping and hugging all around, which I wouldn't mention except that it was such an unusual sight. No one ever cried on the trading floor. No one ever showed weakness or vulnerability or need for human kindness. There was a single upbeat note struck this day. 
a friend of mine, one of the few remaining older Europeans, stood at his desk from 8 a.m. until noon. He hopped about like a small child on Christmas Eve. What he wanted from Santa was the sack. He had already accepted a better job at another firm. He had intended to quit Solomon at the beginning of the week, but seeing he might be fired instead, he waited and held his tongue, hoping to receive a golden handshake. My friend had been with Solomon for seven years, and, if fired, stood to receive several hundred thousand dollars. I rooted for him. I was sure he deserved the axe, but I was afraid that management might feel reluctant to jilt an employee of such long standing. Thankfully, it swallowed its devotion, gathered its courage, and called him. When the call came through, there was a rush on the floor to congratulate him, and lots of smiles and laughter. He was going to a better afterlife. Saturday, October 17th, 1987, Day 6. I flew to New York for two reasons. Months before, I had agreed to speak to the training program on salesmanship. My speech was scheduled for Tuesday, October 20th. This now appeared to be a grim assignment. For the 250 trainees, the largest class ever, had little hope of keeping their jobs. Because my speech wasn't until Tuesday, I had the day free to roam the 41st floor. Monday, October 19, 1987. Day 7. The stock market fell as it had never fallen before in history, paused, then fell some more. I rushed back and forth between 41 and the equity department on 40. The stock market crash had huge and arbitrary wealth redistributionary effects, and the two floors had entirely different reactions to it. A lucky man in the equity department had gone short Standard & Poor's stock index futures, meaning he had made a large bet that the market would fall on Friday, and by the time he had a chance to close out his bet on Monday, the futures were 63 points lower, and he had cleared $27 million. His joy was unique. The rest of the equity department was tossed between despair and confusion. They were helpless as they watched their beloved market die. Meanwhile, the bond market was shooting through the roof, and more than a few bond traders failed to conceal their glee. The bond traders were making a fortune. The prevailing reasoning in the bond market went like this. Stock prices were lower, therefore, people were less wealthy, therefore, people would consume less. Therefore, the economy would slow down. Therefore, inflation would fall. Maybe there'd even be a depression and deflation. Therefore, interest rates would fall. Therefore, bond prices should rise. So they did. And many of us asked our first questions about the wisdom of the firings of the previous week. The world of money was in upheaval. Funds were rushing out of the stock market and into safe havens. Money was pouring into the money markets as short-term deposits. Had we had a money market department, we could have made a killing presiding over this movement, but we did not and could not. Throughout the crash, John Goodfriend seemed in his element. He was, for the first time in ages, making trading decisions. It was a joy to see a man rediscover his youth. He spent little time at his desk. He sprinted back and forth across the floor and held brief strategy sessions with his head traders. At one point, his attention drifted to his net worth, and he bought 300,000 shares in Solomon Brothers for his personal account. When I overheard him do this, my first reaction was that he was trading on inside information. My second reaction was that as long as it was legal, I should do it too. Pretty greedy, huh? But also pretty smart. Solomon's stock was crashing faster than the market as a whole. All brokerage stocks were getting hit because investors, who had no way to gauge the internal damage we had suffered, assumed the worst. Good friend knew, however, that our losses were not what they seemed. We had lucked into $27 million in the equity department, and the bond departments were rolling in dough. A quick calculation showed that Solomon's share price implied a value for the company less than its liquidation value. After checking with our legal department to make sure I wasn't following Ivan Boski's footsteps, I followed good friends and bought a bunch of Solomon shares with the bonus I was busy lobbying for. Many, many others on our trading floor were doing the same. Goodfriend would later say that it bespoke of a faith in the firm when employees bought Solomon shares and that he personally found it encouraging. Perhaps. But I, for one, wasn't making a statement of faith when I made my purchase. 
my investment was raw self-interest, coupled with a certain abstract pleasure in having found a smart bet. Within a few months, Solomon shares had bounced back from a low of $16 to $26. Tuesday, October 20th, 1987. Day 8. The last day I clearly recall of my time at Solomon Brothers. I spent an uneasy hour in the training class talking to 250 blank stares. The trainees had reached that state of high despair that resembles accounts I have read of the Black Death of the 14th century. They had lost all hope and decided that since they were going to be fired anyway, they might as well do whatever they please. So they all became back row people. I dodged a paper wad as I entered the room, and an impressive amount of apathy as I spoke, but they were vaguely curious if there were any job opportunities in the London office, and if I knew when they would be fired. They were left to wonder for only two hours more. The speaker who followed me was interrupted by the entrance of Jim Massey, flanked by two men who looked like bodyguards, but who were only traitors. He bore the fate of the 250 trainees. Before making it known, however, he explained in merciless detail how difficult the firings had been on senior management, how ultimately they would make the firm stronger, and how these sorts of decisions were always painful to make. And then he announced, We have made our decision regarding the training program, and we have decided to maintain our commitment. You can stay, was the message. A handful of people scrambled back into the front row as soon as Massey had left. But the news wasn't as cheery as it sounded. There were no vacancies on the trading floor. At the end of the program, most of the trainees became clerks in the back office. December 17, 1987. Bonus Day. A strange and glorious day. The firm, for the first time in its history broke the compensation bands. It was lucky for me. My bonus was meant to fall within the band, which would have limited to about $140,000. Instead, it paid me $225,000, $275 with benefits but who's counting, which is more than it had ever paid an employee two years out of the training program, or so I have been told. I was now the highest paid member of my training class but that meant less than it did. More than half my class had either quit or been fired. It was now clear that given time and only time, the firm would make me a rich man. Doing the same level of business, I would be paid $350 or so next year, $450 the year after that, and $525 the year after that. But it was sad, and a bit ridiculous, to break the bands and pay selected employees more than ever before, in the worst year in the recent history of the firm. The firm cleared $142 million, an abysmal return on $3.5 billion in capital. The numbers looked even worse when you considered that the firm for most of the year had been twice the size of three years before. Why was it paying me now? I had an idea. When the head of sales presented me with my bonus, the clue to the large sum was in his eyes. Panic. Solomon Brothers, in a sense, made a trade by putting a price on the services of an employee, and now, having lost a great number of people, it was less composed than usual as it traded. It paid me more because it thought that would compel me to stay, seal my loyalty. What loyalty I had was already sealed. I felt loyal to a handful of individuals, Dash, Alexander, my jungle guide, my rabbis. But how can you speak of loyalty to the firm when the firm is an amalgam of small and large deceptions and riven with strife and discontent? You can't. And why even try? By now, it was abundantly clear that the money game rewarded disloyalty. The people who hopped from firm to firm and, in the process, secured large pay guarantees did much better financially than the people who stayed in one place. Solomon Senior Management had never before tried to purchase the loyalty of its people. The managers weren't much good at the game. They could have seen, had they looked at me with the eyes of a liar's poker champion, that I would never leave or stay because of money. I'd never have gone to another firm for a higher paycheck. I'd leave Solomon Brothers for other reasons, however. And I did.
I left Solomon Brothers in the beginning of 1988, but not for any of the obvious reasons. I didn't think the firm was doomed. I didn't think that Wall Street would collapse. I wasn't even suffering from growing disillusionment. It grew to a point, still bearable, then stopped. Although there were many perfectly plausible reasons to jump ship, I left, I think, more because I didn't need to stay any longer. My father's generation grew up with certain beliefs. One of those beliefs is that the amount of money one earns is a rough guide to one's contribution to the welfare and prosperity of our society. It took watching his son being paid 225 grand at the age of 27, after two years on the job, to shake his faith in money. He has only recently recovered from the shock. I haven't. When you sit, as I did, at the center of what has been possibly the most absurd money game ever, and benefit out of all proportion to your value to society, when hundreds of equally undeserving people around you are all raking it in faster than they can count it, what happens to the money belief? Well, that depends. For some, good fortune simply reinforces the belief. They take the funny money seriously, as evidence that they are worthy citizens of the Republic. It is tempting to believe that people who think this way eventually suffer their comeuppance. They don't. They just get richer. I'm sure most of them die fat and happy. For me, however, the belief in the meaning of making dollars crumbled. The proposition that the more money you earn, the better the life you are leading, was refuted by too much hard evidence to the contrary. And without that belief, I lost the need to make huge sums of money. The funny thing is that I was largely unaware how heavily influenced I was by the money belief until it had vanished. It is a small piece of education, but still the most useful thing I picked up at Solomon Brothers. Almost everything else I learned I left behind. I became fairly handy with a few hundred million dollars, but I'm still lost when I have to decide what to do with a few thousand. I learned humility briefly in the training program, but forgot it as soon as I was given a chance. And I learned that people can be corrupted by organizations, but since I remain willing to join organizations, and even to be corrupted by them, mildly, I'm not sure what practical benefit will come from this lesson. All in all, it seems, I didn't learn much of practical value. Perhaps the best was yet to come, and I left too soon. But having lost my need to stay at Solomon Brothers, I discovered a need to leave. My job became nothing more than showing up every morning to do what I had already done, the reward for which was simply more of the same. I disliked the lack of adventure. You might say that I left the trading floor of Solomon Brothers in search of risk, which was as stupid a financial decision as I hope I'll ever make. In the markets, you don't take risk without being paid hard cash at the same time. Even in the job market, it's a handy rule, and I have broken it. I am now both poorer and more exposed than I would have been had I remained on the trading floor. So, on the face of it, my decision to leave was an almost suicidal trade, the sort of thing a customer might do if he fell into the hands of a geek salesman at Solomon. I believe I walked away from the clearest shot I'll ever have at being a millionaire. Sure, Solomon Brothers had fallen on hard times, but there was still plenty of gravy on the tray for a good middleman. That is the nature of the game. And if Solomon turns itself around, the money will flow even more freely. As it happens, I still own shares in Solomon Brothers, because I believe it will eventually recover. The strength of the firm lies in the raw instincts of people like John Merriweather, the liar's poker champion of the world. People with those instincts, including Merriweather and his boys, are still trading bonds for Solomon. Anyway, business at Solomon simply couldn't get much worse. The captains have done their level best to sink the ship, and the ship insists on floating. If I made a bad trade, it's because I wasn't making a trade. I was given pause, however, after I had decided to vamoose, to think that maybe what I was doing wasn't so foolish after all. Alexander insisted at our farewell dinner that I was making a great move. The best decisions he had made in his life, he said, were completely unexpected, the ones that cut against convention. Then he went even further. 
He said that every decision he has forced himself to make, because it was unexpected, has been a good one. It was refreshing to hear a case for unpredictability in this age of careful career planning. It would be nice if it were true.